Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this, the third Minute University Housing Conference entitled this year, Home, a Human Right. I'm Seamus Taylor. I'm head of the Department of Applied Social Studies at Minute University. I am delighted to welcome you all here today. It's an excellent, timely and apposite agenda that we have over the next two days. Usually we thank people at the end of these events. However, I just wanted to acknowledge the leadership of Dr. Rory Hearn, my colleague, in organizing this conference. I also want to acknowledge our colleagues in Moosey, led by uh, Professor Linda Connolly and supported very ably by Anne and Orla, who have provided excellent support for the conference. I'm delighted that Linda is here today and will be chairing the next session. And thanks to Department of Applied Social Studies colleagues, Karen, Kira, Gloria and Tanya, who are all contributing at various stages over the next two days. We are delighted in the Department of Applied Social Studies to be co-hosting the conference with Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute. This conference aligns perfectly with our mission as a department, which is to advance understanding policy and practice in social policy and the social professions underpinned by the values of advancing human rights, equality and social justice. And we are delighted that later this morning in a short time, Minister Dara O'Brien will be joining us. We do really um, appreciate him taking the time out of his very busy schedule to contribute here this morning. In uh, preparing uh, last night for what I might say in this introduction, I was thinking back to when Beveridge launched his report on um, that really uh, marked the start of the modern British welfare state. And he set out five pillars of the modern welfare state. Uh, and one integral pillar was housing. Uh, they call for a comprehensive state housing policy where the state firmly held the ring on housing. Beveridge viewed housing as a pillar of a welfare society, co-productive of social and economic well-being alongside universal health care and comprehensive education. We never got that post-World War II welfare state settlement in Ireland, not that they got it fully in Britain indeed ever. We never got a national health service here, we didn't get comprehensive state-backed education or a comprehensive state housing policy. In a sense, what we got is a kind of peculiar Irish version of the welfare state. We got in part another form of Irish exceptionalism, Irish policy exceptionalism, marked by a kind of initially a cautious state conservatism and then in time, a trenchant underwriting of private market provision in housing, and most recently, a widespread commodification of housing. Right now, very understandably, and rightly so, we are preoccupied with the COVID-19 pandemic, its containment, its suppression, and in time, hopefully its passage into mass vaccination and a return to a, a more normal or new normal state of living. Lurking within and beneath and amplifying COVID-19 are other major social challenges, if not crises. Not least of these is the housing crisis. Over the next two days, there will be much debate on the strengths and weaknesses of current housing policy in Ireland comparing us to uh, neighboring jurisdictions and further afield, and the opportunity that is potentially offered by embarking on a new housing plan in Ireland. We can argue on the detail uh, about what has been achieved and not been achieved, and no doubt we will over the next two days. However, some of the evidence is stark. There are more families homeless today than when we start the last Rebuilding Ireland plan. Over the past four years, 4,167 families 
have become newly homeless in Dublin alone. We have had limited success through the Rebuilding Ireland plan. At best, its verdict may be quite a bit started, quite a lot done, but a hell of a lot more to do. At a more fundamental level, the scale of the challenge in housing begs a number of questions and challenges as we embark on a new housing plan in Ireland. And these are some of the questions I suggest we think about over the next two days. Do we need a values rethink in the area of housing policy? Are there either um, inadvertent or otherwise ideological barriers to giving a fair hearing to viable housing alternatives based on evidence? Have we embedded notions that public provision is bad and private provision is always good? What's the purpose of state housing policy? And how have we allowed ourselves to commodify housing to such an extent in Ireland that we have in some ways lost its sense as a home, a place of shelter and nurturing, and are so easily obsessed with its role as a wealth generator. What can we learn from good practice elsewhere? What can we draw from the experience of cities like Vienna? Given what has occurred with vulture fund acquisitions in recent years, how now do we uh, embark on and adapt a new state housing policy for public good and social good rather than simply for economic gain? I don't attempt to, and I don't have the time to answer these questions now. However, I encourage you to engage with them over the next two years. In coming to a conclusion in this introductory piece, it seems to me that housing inequality and housing poverty in Ireland or housing deprivation is fundamentally linked to wider inequality in society. In a way, ultimately, our state housing policy reflects the level of inequality that we are prepared to put up with or tolerate as a society. At a level, being housing poor or housing deprived in Ireland today may amount to being stuck as a family in a one room homeless hotel, feeling powerless, whilst other of us can live in homes and with gardens that we will never ever be able to fully occupy. From the housing policy that we have pursued in Ireland in recent decades, by implication, we are implying that we have a high tolerance of wider social and economic inequality, which is the context within which housing inequality arises. I think the day is coming and it's going to come sooner rather than later when we're going to have to stand back in a very fundamental way from housing policy and ask the most basic questions. What is it for? Who is it for? What human need is it meeting? When we do that in the most fundamental ways, I think that brings us to the concept of home. Hopefully, we can find our way back home. I'd say we need to find our way back to home and that concept to our equal claim as human beings to a home which provides security, safety, shelter, and the basis of nurturing underpinned by justiciable human rights that are there to meet one of the most basic of our human needs. That's as much as I want to say by way of introduction. I want to wish people a great conference. Remember to use the hashtag home a human right throughout the conference. There just also one or two things to point out before I hand over. Uh, this is not 
there isn't a Q&A in every session of the conference, but you can place questions into the chat and they can be responded to later if there isn't a Q&A in that particular session. Um, one final thing to say is that remember there is a lot we can all do in relation to housing situation in Ireland, whether that is becoming involved in education, research around the issue, activism, getting involved in politics. And I know Rory is going to mention that in much more detail a little later. So what I want to just end by saying is enjoy the two days. I will see people later and again tomorrow. And I now am delighted to hand over to my colleague, Professor Linda Connolly, the director of Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute. So over to Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seamus. And um, good morning, everyone. I admire your energy, uh, Seamus. And uh, thank you so much for those uh, comments. Um, so I'm very happy to be here this morning, here in Virtue Commas, of course, online, but I hope uh, it'll be a very uh, pleasant and enriching experience for everyone. Um, I'm, I'm not going to delay too long because I am under strict instructions to keep to time, but um, I'm just very pleased that our institute, the Institute for Social Science, is collaborating with Dr. Rory Hearn and the Department of Applied Social Studies on this conference. We have a number of projects over the years and also current research on the whole question of housing. And it seems like we've been doing this research for a very, very long time. Uh, home is a human right, as we were discussing this morning, but it's also an absolutely massive social and political challenge. And we certainly in our Institute for Social Science are here and available and really willing to help uh, work to uh, resolve the questions around uh, home and housing in the Irish context at the current conjuncture. Uh, we've all spent more time than we normally would in the context uh, of the places uh, we live um, uh, in the last years. We have seen the impact um, on, of the pandemic uh, on, on households, but also on those excluded uh, from uh, the right to a home. And I hope and uh, really uh, anticipate that the discussions today will be picked up on in, in the policy arena. And that, as I said, we are all here to work um, together on that. Um, it reminds me of, um, I, I'm a sociologist and uh, I taught a course on the sociology of the family for years. And I always think of that sort of dichotomy around home <coughs> Um, that Scott Lash introduced that uh, home as a haven in a heartless world uh, where we go to, um, you know, for comfort and sustenance. Never has that been uh, more true in the last 12 months. But the corollary of that home is also a place in which social inequality is uh, reproduced in society, class inequality, gender inequality, etc. But, but also a potentially dangerous place to be. So the whole concept of home, I think, presents different kinds of scenarios which we have to be able to confront and deal with. And in the last year or so, that has become increasingly apparent. So I am delighted this morning to introduce our first speaker who's going to speak uh, for about 25 to 30 minutes um, to this theme of home and human right. And as Seamus then said, um, I'll ask one or two questions. <clears throat> if you have a question or a point in the chat, by all means, go ahead. I probably won't get to all of them at the end, depending on time, um, but please feel free uh, to participate as best you can. This is what we have to do uh, in the current context uh, online, but we'll keep going. So uh, Professor Manuel Albers uh, is Professor of Urban and Economic Geography at the University of Leuven and author of The Financialization of Housing. Um, he is a human geographer, uh, a sociologist and an urban planner. Um, and is uh, actually professor of geography. Um, he leads a research group on the intersection of real estate, finance and states, which is spearheaded by a grant from the European Research Council. I can see you there um, just coming on. Um, Manuel has published on um, financialization, 
social and financial exclusion, neoliberalism, mortgage markets, the privatization of <coughs> social housing and neighborhood decline. So I'm delighted uh, very much to, again, welcome you here in Virgin Commons this morning. Um, it's a pity you're not here with us in Ireland today, but you're very welcome, Manuel, and I look forward to hearing your paper. Thank you very much, Linda, for that introduction. Uh, thanks also, Rory, for inviting me. I will now start sharing my screen. So give me a second to set this up. You should be seeing my PowerPoint now. Is that correct? Perfect, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank great. You. Then we can really get started. Uh, yeah, so Rory asked me to talk about many, many different things today. Um, I won't repeat all the questions he asked me because that will take up a full two minutes. And then Seamus uh, came up with a set of questions overlapping with Rory's, but another set of questions. I will try to address some of those questions, but to do them well, I can only do a few of those questions. So apologies for that. Um, my talk is partly based on the book that's been mentioned that you see on the left here, The Financialization of Housing, a Political Economy Approach. Uh, but I also built on several papers that I've often been writing with co-authors. So what I'm presenting here is not just my work. At the bottom, you can often see, I think it's an orange, uh, a little banner uh, that often has a reference to the paper that I'm relying on and also the co-authors involved there. Um, so you don't need to buy the book. Uh, of course, I'm happy if you do, but also if you see the, the to the bottom right, there's a website there. And that includes most of my papers. And some of the chapters in the book have also been published as papers. So uh, if you register on academia.edu, you can download lots of academic papers for free. Um, people just need to be aware of it. And academics typically are, but non-academics often are not. Um, so this is good to know for many people. There's another website that people often use, ResearchGate, but I use academia.edu. But it might be good to, uh, to know where you can download a lot of housing papers. Um, so why study housing? Or another question is why is housing a human right? Um, if we go back to the early housing policies, those weren't policies about assets. They weren't policies about home ownership. They weren't policies for people to, uh, you can say, enrich themselves through housing. The original housing policies were health policies. The origins of housing policies in most countries are in health policies. So we all know these kind of pictures uh, that were sort of popularized later on, but showing how the other half lives, or in many countries, uh, this was much more than the other half. And of course, something we're reminded of today in the COVID crisis is that health is actually very much related to housing. Linda already reminded us of it. Um, but it also reminds us that the health situation is not just a personal situation. If other people are not well housed, if other people are on the streets, for instance, it is much harder for them to quarantine. It is much easier for them uh, to get a virus um, and it is much easier for them to spread the virus. So homelessness is not just a person's problem or is not even the state's problem. The homelessness on the street is also my problem because when I go to the supermarket, when I go to the bank in my neighborhood, there's usually a homeless person sitting in front of either of them asking for money. And why is this my problem? Well, it could be on the moral reasons, but it's on a very practical reason. If this person is on the street and spreading diseases, this actually becomes my problem. So this is one reason why we study housing. It is also one reason why housing is a human right. So this goes beyond just the idea of a shelter. Like, yes, a shelter is a personal one, but you can say it goes beyond that. It is important because, and this is actually the last bullet point that I start with now, uh, it is a merit good, uh, which is a commodity that's judged that an individual or society should have on the basis of some concept of need rather than the ability and willingness to pay. That doesn't automatically mean that therefore housing is a public good. It can be offered as a public good. Merit goods can be offered as either public goods or private goods. That is an open question, it's a policy question, but it is a question where society benefits if someone else in society has it. Me benefiting from there not being homeless people on the street because it makes it less easier to spread the vaccine, for instance. Of course, at the most basic level, people are entitled to housing uh, because they have a need for shelter, but also a, a place to call home, something Linda also, also mentioned briefly. Uh, we can also think of social and physical reproduction. And this is not just about like, sort of producing children. This is also about um, the social reproduction of norms and values. They happen primarily in two places, in school 
and at home. So you need to have a safe home for that to be able to take place. But the physical reproduction here is actually a term that's also being used um, for employers. There needs to be a social and physical reproduction, not just to having more children, but in a way of a laborer reproducing themselves by sleeping well at night and being a productive uh, laborer the next day. Um, so it's in the interests of, you could say, employers, uh, of um, the system at large, also the economic system at large, that people have a good home where they can rest and then can participate in the workplace, in civil society, in all kinds of other domains of life. If people have a better home life, it makes it easier to also have a better public life. Uh, and of course, housing is connected to all kinds of other domains of life. I already mentioned health, but it's also connected to access to services, education, employment, transportation, and all of those things, of course, heavily are tied into location. And we know that certain types of houses tend to be in certain types of locations. And we cannot separate uh, the idea of housing from the, from the idea of geography. There's always a geography to housing, even at the micro scale. Uh, I live in an apartment block that has uh, 10 stories. I live on the second floor, but my neighbors on the 10th floor, uh, they have a big problem if the elevator doesn't work. But if the elevator does work, they have a beautiful view all over the city because most of the buildings in my neighborhood are only four stories high. So even sort of in the micro geography of it, there can be a big difference uh, between the location of the house. Um, inequality was already mentioned by, by Shimas also, poverty. Uh, but of course, also environmental conditions are becoming more and more important in how we assess housing location. I think they've always been important, but there's more awareness of this now. Air, soil, etc. Uh, and it has all kinds of connections to the economy. Also, uh, just beyond employment, in some neighborhoods, there might be very different access also to shops, uh, to support. Uh, this is one reason why it's often problematic to move poor people around, because they, they lose their support networks. So... This was, in a way, an introduction to say, why is, why is housing a human right and why should we study it? As the title suggests of my talk, I'm talking more about how homes are being played around with, uh, and that I call the financization of housing. Soon I will explain what I mean by the financization of housing, but first I'd like to start with a graph. It's a graph made by a colleague from a, a university in Brussels, Alice Roman Fields. She made it uh, for her PhD. Um, and it's a very simple figure. I could have reproduced the same figure myself, but she already made it. And it's so simple that I think it works quite well everywhere. I could have made it for Dublin as well, if I would have looked up the statistics. You can make it for, I think, more than 90% of the cities in the world, you can make a graph like this. So what we see on the vertical axis are index numbers. So both numbers start at 100. Uh, and then we see how those numbers change over time. If we first look at the bottom line, that's more or less flat. And these little crosses, this is average household income. And this basically shows that in the Brussels capital region, um, where I live, um, the, the income is more or less flat. Uh, in many other Western cities, actually, this will be going up a little bit or maybe up and then down a little bit. But overall, there's often a slightly positive trend. In that sense, Brussels is a little bit of an outlier of the line being more flat. Uh, Brussels is not a rich city, contrary to what people think. Unemployment rates are very high in Brussels, comparable to parts of the inner land of Spain and cities in the south of Italy. Um, but then if we look at housing prices, we see that for a while, they stay quite stable. And uh, they even track income development, where income goes down a little bit, the housing prices follow one or two years later going down, where income goes up a little bit, it goes up a little bit around the year 2000. But something started, starts to change around 2003. Housing prices start to go up more. And from 2004 onwards, they start up going really steep up to about 2007 when the crisis hits. But what happens when the global financial crisis hits, the housing prices don't go down, they stabilize, but they stabilize at a much higher level. So in a matter of just like five to 10 years, the housing prices have doubled while the income stays the same. This is a picture we see around most cities in the world. It's not necessarily a doubling. In some places, it's a tripling of the prices. In some places, it's one and a half times. The timing might be different. In some places, this happens in the 90s. In some places, it happened more in recent years. But the overall picture is household income stays either quite stable or goes up a little bit, while housing prices and also housing rents increase much faster. And the fact that it happens around the world and not just in one or two cities means that if we want to understand in this case what happens in Brussels, of course we have to understand the Brussels labor market, uh, the Brussels housing market, 
national policies in Belgium, but we also need to understand why this happens in most cities around the world and even in most non-urban places in the world. In many parts of the countryside, something very similar happens. So we have to understand that this is not just a local trend, although it is also a local trend. So this term financialization of housing, I started using this in 2008 when I wrote the first paper about the financialization of housing. And the term financialization was then becoming a bit more popular, uh, but it wasn't really, it wasn't used for housing yet. And what we see in the last uh, five to 10 years, the term has been widely applied to housing and it's been done by a wide range of people. On the top left and the top right, you see two references to the UN Rapporteur on the right to housing. Um, tomorrow, I think there's a, uh, there's a presentation by Lailani Farha, or is it this afternoon? It doesn't matter, either today or tomorrow. Uh, there's a presentation by her, and she's the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing. Also, the person preceding her, Raquel Rolnik, now Professor of, uh, of Urban Planning uh, in Sao Paulo, she also started talking about the financialization of housing. So the last two Special Rapporteurs on the Right to Housing took the financialization of housing as a big problem to be discussed. Um, so this is, happens at the level of the UN, but if you see the bottom left, you also see a report from uh, the European Action Coalition on the right to housing. So this is a number of uh, housing activists, housing advocates, uh, and people who speak on behalf of tenants also. They wrote a report together. You can also find this online, Hands of Our Homes, the Financialization of Housing in Europe. So two very different kind of actors. And then at the bottom right, you see the two locals, the European Commission and the City of Amsterdam. And then the title of a workshop that was co-organized by these two institutions. So one supranational one and one city really dealing with the financialization of housing. Uh, if you control for income, housing in Amsterdam is more expensive than housing in London. Uh, of course, the housing in London is really more expensive because the incomes are so much higher. Uh, in Amsterdam, average income is just slightly above the nat national average. Of course, in London is much higher. But yet in Amsterdam, the houses are much, much more expensive than elsewhere in the country. Um, so very expensive cities, and I, they also organized a workshop, how, uh, EU cities in the financialization of the housing market. So you see from very different kind of actors, this interest in housing. I don't have an option to look at the chat and the Q&A now, but I will do that once the presentation is over. So I've been making a number of key claims, especially in several papers together with Rodrigo Fernandez, who works for an NGO SOMO in Amsterdam, but who used to work with me at, uh, at KU Leuven. And we argue that housing is central to financialized capitalism. Housing is not just another asset to be financialized, it's the key asset to financialize. And in the next slide, I will actually show one piece of evidence why this is the case. And the financialization of housing is not limited to mortgage markets, uh, mortgage securitization, so the reselling of mortgages in financial markets, but it extends into rental housing and especially former, formerly social rented housing, but it also expands into the development and construction of housing. The financialization of housing is geographically variegated, meaning there are differences between places, but there are common trends and trajectories. Uh, so I can't discuss all these, these differences, of course, so I'm going to focus in the presentation a bit more on the commonalities. And the global financial crisis was seen uh, as something that might stop the financialization of housing. People said like, well, we now realize that this two-way coupling of housing and finance doesn't work very well. Housing prices will go down. Housing will become more affordable. Well, it hasn't happened. It has slowed down in some places. Uh, but often only for a number of years, then to kickstart it again, and it has further than others. And we also see new countries that weren't really financialized yet and new sub markets opening up. And with new sub markets, you can, for instance, think of student housing or housing for elderly people. So specific target groups also where financialization is now uh, going into. Then another graph, again, not a graph made by myself, but by a number of economists, uh, some of them associated with the Federal Reserve in the US. And I'm gonna go through this graph with you so you don't need to look at the whole thing yet. Uh, what they tried to do for a period of 140 years, so what you see at the horizontal axis, 1870 to 2011, uh, they collected data, which in itself is already quite something. And they did this for 17 OECD countries. So basically 17 of the richest countries in the world. And what they did is they compared the rates of bank lending to the size of the economy so this is called the ratio of bank lending to GDP, so global domestic products. This is what you see in the vertical axis. Um, so it's always the size of lending compared to the size of the economy in that particular year. And we start with the blue line. You don't need to look at the red line yet. And we see this is non-mortgage lending. And we see from 1870 
to uh, the 1920s is more or less doubles compared to the size of the economy. So lending expands, but this actually takes 50 years for this, this expansion of market lending. The First World War doesn't have a, main, a major impact on this. The crisis of the 1930s does. The Second World War also means that non-market lending really collapses. And then we see in the 1940s a straight line up, basically from 45, 46 onwards. But it takes until 1980 for the rate for the, the level of non market lending to be back at the level of the 1920s. Then we see the line starts going up a bit steeper in the 1980s, goes down again in the 1990s, and then goes up a bit more. But it's it hovers around between four and five percent of the size of, of the economy. Um, so what we see here uh, in non market lending, this is all lending that's not lending on real estate. So this is lending to your corner store. To, to big multinationals, and uh, this is lending to government, this is lending on student loans, car loans, credit cards, everything, but not lending on real estate. So if you look at the red line, this is mortgage lending, and it includes a few other forms of lending on real estate, depending on the jurisdiction. In some countries, mortgage lending isn't really mortgage lending. It has a different legal status. Therefore, the definition is actually slightly wider. And what we see between 1870 and the First World War, that the level of mortgage lending uh, also basically doubles, uh, but we see that this line traces the blue line. They go more or less up together. They stabilize together. The First World War has a main, uh, major impact on mortgage lending. It really goes down. But by the 1930s, mortgage lending is back up again. And whereas non-mortgage lending really falls in the 1930s, the crisis of the 1930s, mortgage lending doesn't really start to fall until the late 1930s. Drops during the Second World War, but not as dramatically as non-market lending. During the Second World War, for, for just a few years, there is now more market lending than all the other forms of lending combined. And it takes a bit longer for market lending to pick up again after it falls. But from 1950 onwards, the line goes up. And you can see the two lines, the blue and the red line, are parallel again. So the market lending line is sort of following the trend of the non-market lending. And then you see something starts to happen in the mid 1980s. The line first stabilizes a little bit and then it starts to go up really steep. And especially if you consider this is an average for 17 countries, this is quite exceptional because it means that almost all of those countries must have had a significant increase at the same time. The increase slows down a little bit in the 1990s, but still goes up. And in the late 1990s, it starts to go up really steep. And in the 2000s, it goes up even steeper. And then in 2005, 2006, it's almost a complete vertical line. And then you see this little thing at the end of the line. That's the crisis of 2007, 2008, 2009. The numbers we have for some of these countries after 2011, we know that the red line is either going up again or it's stabilizing. It hasn't really come down for more than a few years in any place. Um, plus, all the countries that are not in here, so the rest of the world, so to speak, this red line is also going up. There's only very few countries where market lending is not expanding. And for most of the rest of the world, middle and, and, and lower income countries, the line only starts really increasing from 2010, 2012 onwards. So what are the causes of this? There's a whole range of this. I'm just gonna discuss two of them that are related. And the one is what Corin Clark, uh, an economist at Oxford calls pension fund capitalism. And this doesn't just have to do with pension funds, it has to do with what are known as institutional investors. This includes pension funds, but also insurance companies and sovereign wealth. So sovereign wealth funds, you can think of big state funds and you find them typically in countries that have a lot of energy, uh, so oil or gas. So the Middle East, Middle Eastern countries has them, but Norway also has one of the biggest ones. And you find them in countries where the state takes a bigger role in the economy, especially in East Asia, in quite different countries, South Korea, Japan, uh, China, Singapore, for instance, all have sovereign wealth funds as well. So these are some of the biggest investors in the world. And what Gordon Clark is arguing that these pension funds, the amount of money they invest is growing much faster than the rest of the economy is growing. So this sounds good. We're saving up for our pensions. We're saving up for insurance. State funds are, are having more money to, to invest. But the downside of it is since these investors are so big, they constantly need to find new things to invest in and the economy is not growing fast enough. So just like our housing prices and rents go up faster than our income, also the amount of money that pension funds and these other investors have goes up faster 
than our economy grows. So our economy grows a little bit over time, but the amount of money that needs to be invested in it grows much faster. So this is a long-term development that started in the 1970s. There's a shorter term effect, which is something of the last 10 years, which has to do with the monetary policies. And one important element of this is to keep the interest rates low. Another element is the quantitative easing, pumping more money in the economy that you and I probably never saw much of, but a lot of financial institutions get a lot of it. But if we focus on the low interest rates, it means that a lot of these investors, and most of them uh, under number one here, are quite risk averse. They don't want to invest in risky things. They want to invest in what is known as high quality collateral. Most pension funds in the world by state law have to invest all or most of their money in high quality collateral. So these are relatively safe investments, low risk. And what are these kind of safe investments? These are government bonds, for instance. They are also a small number of companies in the stock exchange, companies that do well in the long term and are not too affected by crises. And the other thing they can invest in is real estate debts and assets. Uh, so this is important because especially in the period of austerity, government debt was not increasing. During COVID now it is, but for a number of years it wasn't. The number of companies that is considered safe, that is considered high quality collateral is increasing. So this money can go almost nowhere else than into real estate debt and assets. <coughs> Apologies. So what we see is a global pool of liquidity, basically money, looking for a safe haven to invest in. And it goes into the financialization of housing and other forms of real estate through mortgage securitization, but also leverage, that's debt, loans for housing market actors. People will take out a loan, also developers will take out loans, and it goes into buying up rental houses, as you will see in a minute. One more illustration about these idea of pension funds having a lot of money. This is Dutch, just for Dutch institutional investors, but you have to know that the third largest pension fund in the world is a Dutch pension fund. If the whole world would have pension funds like the Dutch, um, it would be great because people would have good pensions and it would be super problematic because we don't have enough money to invest in if there would be that much money in pension funds. What we basically see, you don't have to look at the different colors here, that the amount that the pension funds have doubles every 10 years. Of course, the Dutch economy doesn't double every 10 years, nor does the global economy. So this is an illustration of this extra money needing to go somewhere. And where is it going? It is going into real estate. So again, the same years, 10 years apart. And uh, what we see here is different forms of investing uh, in real estate, either direct or indirect. I'm not going to explain the difference just yet. Uh, but the four bars can, uh, add up to all being investments in real estate from pension funds and insurance companies. And what we basically see is that the amount of money that goes into real estate more or less triples every 10 years. So not only is there much more money going into uh, the pension funds, most, a lot of their more money is going into real estate. So this is one reason why our rents go up and our housing prices go up. And now you see the bar with the dots. This is what pension funds put indirectly in real estate. So on their books, it won't say we own this in this building. It say we own so many stocks, for instance, in real estate investment trust or other funds that buy up housing and in which pension funds and index funds are the biggest shareholders. So this picture is just for the US. And if you look at the bars, you see the number of real estate investment trusts who buy up uh, often offices, uh, but these days also housing. Uh, but this is for all kinds of real estate investment trusts in the US together. You see in the bars, the number at some point in the 80s almost doubles, then declines a little bit again. It goes up and down, but it's not a massive increase, actually, if you see the whole period here, uh, which is significantly longer than my lifetime. Uh, but then if we see the, the line in here, this is the market capitalization. So how much money is going into these funds? Well, we see that the line actually goes up quite a bit from 1971 to 1995 because it's still very low, it's hard to see, uh, but it comes from almost zero. Then we see around the turn of the century, uh, the money deflates. And then from 2000 onwards, the line goes up steep. We see it going down again, a little bit around the global financial crisis, and it just keeps on going up. So this again is just for the US, includes also offices, uh, but it shows very clearly these real estate investment funds, uh, trusts are becoming bigger and bigger. They're not just more of them, but they have more and more money into our real estate. And these real estate investment trusts uh, are everywhere in the world. This picture, I think, is from 2013. So it's a bit outdated. I want to make a new one of this soon. This one is from ING. Uh, I want to do the study myself and see where we are now. In orange, it shows countries that already had REITs in 2013. 
Uh, in blue, it shows countries that are considering it, and most of them have introduced it in the meantime. A number of other countries have introduced it too. What you also see here, it's not necessarily Western European countries who are the first to pick up after the US. The Netherlands is relatively fast, but the UK is not. You don't see, even see Ireland on this picture yet. Uh, Germany is not, France is not, but Brazil, for instance, New Zealand, Australia were relatively uh, early. So yes, it's still uh, mostly Western countries, but for instance, also Brazil and many Western countries were quite late. So it's not a clear West versus East or North versus South picture, it's more complicated. These investors, as I said, traditionally were mostly interested in offices. They're becoming more and more interested in housing. And this is a picture from Germany. And I can see I'm slowly running out of time. It's good. I just have a few more slides. Uh, but it's important to, to look at this slide here because it shows what can happen in just 10 years time, uh, 10, 15 years time. What I did here, together with former PhD student, Gertjan Weiber, he also wrote a great paper, The Definancialization of Housing, and that was published last year in Housing Studies. It's probably also available uh, for free. I think it's an open access paper. So the, the, the first uh, name you see in, in orange here, Weiber, uh, if you Google his name, The Definancialization of Housing, great paper, and uh, that shows a lot of ways how to definancialize housing. But together with him, I tried to show, we tried to map what happened in Germany. So in the left column, you see some of the biggest transactions of entire housing associations uh, being sold to private investors. So when we say public ownership, it's a little bit cheating here. The German system is quite complicated with many different types of associations. Some are public, some are nonprofits. So yeah, we all call them public here, but they're all nonprofits. That would be a bit fairer way to say it. And because of changes in German regulation, it became easier to privatize them, not by selling individual units, like the, the right to buy in the UK, but by selling entire housing associations to private investors. And what we showed in green are private equity funds and hedge funds. So these are often known as the filter funds. So you see Blackstone pop up here, you see a Deutsche Bank pop up here, it's the investment part of Deutsche Bank. Siberis, one of the biggest private equity funds, Goldman Sachs, Fortress. So this is basically the city of London combined with Wall Street buying up housing. Many of them had never owned housing before, they didn't know how to manage it. And then in purple, you see real estate investment trusts. So these private equity and hedge funds were buying up with TD, we buy low, we sell high. This is the purest definition of speculation. You buy with the sole intent to sell for a higher price, right? So we can have a long discussion what speculation and housing means, but even according to the most narrow definition of speculation, this is speculation. The purple actors, these are these real estate investment trusts where there's a lot of pension fund money behind. These are a bit harder to explain in that sense. Are they speculating? Well, not according to the na most narrow definition because most of them don't buy with the idea to resell as fast as possible. They may be reselling some, some housing down the line, but so many people who are homeowners, so many housing associations down the line. But most of them own to invest for a number of years. And often this is not two or three years, it's more 10, 15, 20, 25 years. So this is a very different investment horizon. So they're quite different from, the, from these vulture funds, but of course they're still in the business of making money. So the irony is now that you might be working in a factory, putting money in a pension fund, and your pension fund does reasonably well, but at the same time, your pension fund is investing in a real estate investment trust that makes the house where you live in more expensive every year. So this is one of the ways capitalism can work these days. So you have an interest in people paying a high rent with your pension interest, but of course you don't have an interest in paying a high interest yourself. So this is often told as a Berlin story. It's not a story of Berlin. Actually, this happened throughout Germany. A few million uh, units were privatized in less than 10 years' times. More units were privatized than under the right to buy in the UK uh, in 30 years. So this is a much bigger privatization that we hear less of. In Berlin, it's become a big story because it's become uh, politically much more contested. So you see here two headlines, one from March 2019 and one from November 2020. And I put the links in here. I'm also happy to send the presentation to Rory if, if he wants to make it available to people, if there's an option to do that. Uh, so you can follow the links if you want. Um, but basically, Berlin now wants to, the people of Berlin want to renationalize this. Uh, I, can I can talk about this for a long time. I'm not going to do that because I'm running out of time. But it's interesting to look this up. Uh, you may have heard a few days ago, um, there was a different case in Berlin that had to do with uh, the, the, the rent cap, the cap on how much the rent can go up or down. So that's a, 
That's a different thing. Of course, the discussions are related, but it's a different policy than the renationalization. It's going to be very difficult because, of course, those investors want to be paid what the houses are for in their books. They're not going to sell for a lower price. They bought these houses legally. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to take the houses from them, even though now the people in Berlin have said, yes, the state has to do this, the state of Berlin. So there's many things that I haven't discussed today. Uh, one thing that I haven't discussed is the casualization of labor, the fact that more and more people don't have a permanent labor contract, but are dependent on short-term income. Many more people are now called entrepreneurs, and this sounds nice if you actually choose to be an entrepreneur, but many people, of course, didn't choose to be an entrepreneur. They are more or less forced to do so. And this is not just people who work for Deliveroo uh, or for Uber or those kind of things, but it's also all kinds of people who have, for instance, journalists, photographers who used to be hired by newspapers and who are now all freelancers. They are also considered now entrepreneurs and they don't have the security of income either anymore. So it's not just low income people for which it's very problematic, but even for middle income people, more and more people don't have the stability of income. Anymore. I didn't say much about gentrification and displacement, also very important. I didn't say very much about super rich buying housing abroad. It's very interesting, but it's mostly a story of where it's really a significant problem of, of cities like London and New York or uh, specific places, uh, you could say, in sort of leisure capitals and uh, tourist capitals. In other cities, there's a bit of this going on, but it might not be the hugest problem. Touristification and Airbnb, I didn't say anything about either. Of course, this integrates with it. To the left, you see a flyer that was handed out in, in a neighborhood in Amsterdam. And it says, is your house worth 200,000 euros? We will pay you 250,000. We buy, renovate, uh, and, and rent out. The Haarlemmer district will become the first Airbnb neighborhood of the world. Uh, this turned out to be a joke. Uh, people were trying to stir up the debate like this, but in fact, people have been offered uh, uh, higher high offers to buy up the house to use it on Airbnb. The city of Amsterdam is now high, uh, very much fighting Airbnb. Uh, the current coalition in the city of Amsterdam was mostly elected on an anti-tourism platform and an anti-Airbnb platform, but it's super difficult. And in fact, of course, a lot of these things happen. COVID may be a pause in this. It's not going to stop it. So all of these developments that I didn't really were able to discuss in detail, of course, squeeze the market for affordable housing even further. So now we get to the last slide, which are the lessons from housing financializations. And there's eight of them here, and then I'm going to end. So the financialization of housing is driven by the demand for financial products, not the demand for housing primarily. So people often say, well, isn't all this investment by pension funds and other investments in housing great? It just means that there's more money going into housing, so more housing will be available. No, because most of it doesn't go in new housing. And then we get to the second point, they focus on the existing housing stock. So this is beginning to change. There's more and more financialization also of construction uh, taking place, but most of it is investing in mortgages on existing housing or in buying up existing rental housing. So this implies that the additional supply of finance often, mostly, does not result in additional supply of housing. Instead, it results in inflating, that means rising house prices and rents. More money is going in, not in the production, but in existing uh, things, that means the prices go up. And what is also important, this is not simply because the state is retreating. A lot of these practices are enabled by state actors. You can only have real estate investment trust active in your country if the national government has regulated them. It's the same for securitization. If you want to resell mortgages into the financial market, it's only possible if there's been national regulation making this possible. So, of course, governments can also regulate in different ways. They can re-regulate loan-to-value, loan-to-income ratios of mortgage loans. People might find that problematic and they say, I need a bigger loan, otherwise I can't afford the housing. But one reason that the housing price, prices are so high is because so many big loans have been given out. Uh, and the same is true, rental prices can be regulated. Apparently in Berlin, this was now very difficult and they were doing it in a way that was not according to the law, according to some uh, judges, this is still being debated in Germany. Um, but in other places, there's an under regulation, you could say, of rental prices. Governments can also limit monopolies. Uh, for instance, when one landlord or a lender is dominant in the market segment. So this may be the case with real estate investment trusts who sometimes own entire neighborhoods or uh, own a very large share of a particular type of housing, say a flat of 80 square meters in a particular city. One other thing that governments can do is to decriminalize squatting. 
Um, I am not necessarily saying that squatting is a great housing solution. I think it is not a great housing solution. I think it works better than being homeless. But I think why decriminalizing squatting is so good is because if you decriminalize squatting and say, well, if a building has been empty for six months or 12 months, people can occupy it and take possession of it, uh, not in the terms of, of owning, owning it, but in the terms of occupying it. That means that landlords don't want to keep their housing empty, which means that they are more likely to reuse the house. That doesn't necessarily make the house affordable, but at least those houses would be on the market rather than off the market. So that's what I think is the great thing about de decriminalizing squatting is making the housing available, not for squats, but making sure that landlords don't want the houses to be squats and therefore put them back on the market. Uh, and then as a side effect, you will probably have a little bit more squatting as well. Well, that still provides people who might otherwise be homeless with housing. Then there's taxing of vacancies that also doesn't happen, happen enough. Um, also, cities can use land use powers, zoning powers, uh, so proactive government powers. This also doesn't happen enough. Finally, governments can stimulate less or non-financialized forms of housing. So this could be rental housing offered by nonprofits, councils, uh, housing associations, but also grassroots organizations, cooperatives, community land trusts, tenant co uh, collectives, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to say this one is better than that one. In different contexts, one works better than the other one. And also a housing association might work very well for one group, but not for another group. So the more different initiatives that are taken at the same time, the better. And that's where I would like to end. And this is my final slides. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much. That was extremely comprehensive, uh, Manuel, and very, very interesting. And I liked your eight lessons at the end there. It was a very concise way of moving forward. Um, we, ha we, we, ha we are coming up to um, just we have a few minutes left. Um, and there are just two comments, Manuel, which I just ask you to respond to briefly, really, um, because I think what you've done really is kind of set out a very, very clear agenda, which I know will feed in very much into, into the next sessions. Um, we have just two comments here, really, and, and questions, I suppose. One is about the possibility of having two housing systems, uh, one on state land where the occupant either owns or rents the bricks and mortar, but also rents the land and the other on privately owned land where the owner can uh, own not only the house, but also the land under the house. And then the second uh, issue is about the trend towards green pension funds and investing in clean energy. Will that help with finding a home for investment money or will the amount of investment in housing keep increasing? And then I had a third very brief question myself about um, the, the, you know, again, with the impact of the pandemic, uh, is rural relocation um, going to be considered, you know, as, as a possibility with that sort of, I suppose, that the, the importance we see of the digital divide, those who can work from home and don't have to, you know, are not working in supermarkets or, do you know what I'm saying, that there seems to be a new inequality emerging that those who can work at home may be able to continue to have the right to home. We have a bill on this in Ireland at the moment. Um, but there are those who, who won't ever have the choice to work at home because they're lower paid, uh, you know, working in services, restaurants, supermarkets. So is there a new kind of, um, I suppose, divide building up there? So just very briefly in a couple of minutes, if you could address some of those and, and we'll finish up then. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do my best. Uh, the first question is a big one, but in a way it's it's covered partly and very briefly in, in number eight here. Yeah. Um, so if you have a community land trust, you would have the land owned either by the state or by a nonprofit where people would own their land privately. Um, so I think that that is, that is one good solution that could work. Um, what is the problem that it takes a long time to really build a community land trust very well. Brussels has now been working on it for a number of years um, and it has resulted in a small number of units, uh, which I think is good but they could have built almost twice as much social housing with the same amount of money. Um, so it can be a very good solution. And 
in you know the, the city where Bernie Sanders was a mayor, this is the dominant form of housing almost. Um, many people are part of the community land trust, um, but that took a few decades to do that. So community land trusts are great, and I think we should definitely do that. But it's not going to solve the housing crisis on its own. Um, there's other ways also in which to split uh, ownership of land um, from the housing itself. Um, so limit equity cooperatives are also interesting, where people put in money in the building, but also don't get the full price out of it when they resell it because some of it goes into the cooperative. <clears throat> There's ways also of sharing it where you get half of the price increase, but the other half goes back into a collective, which you could say people still can make some money on their house, uh, which in some cases people may actually need for their pension if they, if they are not employed uh, in the former labor market or not employed permanently, this might actually help. But at the same time, it keeps the money also in the organization. So there's many different ways to do it. And I think it would be good to do more of that, but next to also building uh, state subsidized housing either through some sort of council housing or through housing associations next to each other. Um, the trend of pension funds in investing in clean energy, well, that's great, but the amount of money that the pension funds have is still going to keep increasing. Um, so this is not going to be enough for the amount of money they need to invest. Pension funds constantly need to look for, for other things to invest their money in. So it's great that they do this, but um, it's not going to be enough. Also, there's so much, how, uh, so much money, relatively speaking, in real estate that by investments elsewhere increasing a bit, it's only going to decrease a tiny bit in real estate. But at the same time, the amount of money they need to invest. So if they invest a lower share in real estate, the absolute amount they invest in real estate is still going up. Uh, and of course, part of the money that they may invest might also be in clean energy related to housing, which again could be good if it means people have a lower energy bill. But if it means doing this for private run housing, is this meaning that someone else is going to pocket the money, right? Uh, and then Linda's question, um, well, I think one of the things that's been uh, over assessed in a way now, of, or maybe not the right words, um, is that everyone is just going to move to the countryside. I, I don't think that's happening in most places. What we see from some of the first evidence that the housing prices don't go up the most in the city nor in the faraway countryside, it's uh, sort of the nice suburbs uh, plus the nearby countryside. That's where the housing prices go up. And in the cities, we see a diverse view where housing with an extra bedroom, uh, bigger apartments go up more. In Brussels, the prices that went up most were those for larger apartments, not for single family homes. Um, so it's people relocating mostly from a smaller apartment to one with an extra room. Um, the other housing prices that went up are the housing outside the city, but it's all still in commutable distance. I think most people are not thinking, oh, we can be digital nomads. We can work anywhere we want, uh, but okay, I'm gonna work from home three or four days a week, but I still need to go to the city. I also still wanna go to the theater. I still wanna go to nice restaurants. There's many other people why reasons why people live in the city than just for work. And I think this is something that uh, uh, we often keep forgetting during this whole discussion, people are not just living in the city for this. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people actually also commute the other way in many places. Um, they commute from the city to work outside the city. Of course, there's many more jobs also on highways uh, and close to it. So the commuting is going in both directions. Um, so is there going to be a new digital divide? Well, certainly to some extent, because yeah, my garbage man that's just coming by right now, um, <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's going to have to live somewhere close to this because he has to start working every morning at 5 or 6 a.m. Um, so it's going to be more difficult for him <clears throat> than it is for me when I go, you know, in normal times to the office, maybe three days a week. But that still means I need to be in commutable distance. So I think the digital divide in a way is already there. And COVID is maybe making it more pronounced. Yeah. But I don't think it means we have digital nomads and office workers will be living you know, in, in tropical places or very far away in the most nice rural places, because there's lots of things there that they want to have access to, even if it's just one time a week, that they may not have access to anymore. So that may, may make it much more difficult. Great. OK, um, thank you so much um, for what was really, as I said, a really, really interesting paper. There is so much more we could discuss here this morning. I know there are more questions in, in the, the chat and Rory is going to compile those maybe. And, um, you know, we can 
maybe uh, speak to some of the, the uh, people afterwards, but we've run out of time for this session. So um, thank you again um, for contributing to this uh, conference this morning and for a really great paper. Um, and I can see there's about 146 people listening to you here this morning. So so again, this is one of the good things of the, the, the digital um, developments that we have a lot more people engaging um, and listening to your great ideas. So thanks again. And um, I'll hand over now to the next session. Um, I'm not sure who's coming in, but um, I leave you now and I wish everyone well. Enjoy the rest of the conference. It's Rory. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, that was really fantastic and, and a great introduction and start. And I'd just like to uh, welcome everyone to the conference. And we're really looking forward to a, a great two days in terms of trying to address what is, of course, the most serious uh, social crisis, one of the most serious social crisis and economic crisis facing the country. Um, I'd just like to introduce you to this panel, which is discussing after rebuilding Ireland, um, what policies should be in a new housing plan. And we're absolutely delighted to have the Minister for Housing, Darrell O'Brien, with us. We also have other panellists, Owen O'Brien, um, Karen Murphy and PJ Trudy. And just before um, I take in the Minister, I'm going to just do a quick few observations um, and comments, I suppose, introductory context to the, um, the issues based on my own research and work with communities and on this issue. And I suppose in terms of starting, it's really important, and I think we all realise that the, we're really at a, a juncture in the Irish housing system. We're at a crossroads. We are at a point in which the decisions that are going to be made in the coming months and years will have historic uh, ramifications on generations to come and we just have to look at the austerity and the turn to the market in housing over the last three decades and the more recent embrace of the real estate funds to look at the legacy of that in our housing crisis and homelessness today. We are at a point and I set this out in my book housing shock of potentially entering into this dystopia of permanently unaffordable homes with most worryingly the normalization of entrenched homelessness and housing exclusion, a rising inequality between generation rent and investor landlords. But most importantly, and the, the real message we wanted to, we were going to talk about and we want to put out there, is that there is another road we can travel. And it is a road that we have traveled together before. It is one that ensures the basic human right of a home, uh, where an affordable, secure, decent standard, and of course now environmentally sustainable home is available for everyone. And I can see the potential for that, for such an inclusive housing system visible in the commitment, the energy and the work of speakers and participants in this conference. It's visible in the building of new public homes, social and cost rental homes by local authorities and housing associations, in the affordable homes of build, being built by the O'Coolon Cooperative, in the community initiatives like St. Michael's Estate Cost Rental Plan, in the alternative public homes plan of Oscar Trainer Road, and in the growing momentum for a right to housing to be inserted in our constitution. But it's very clear we need a radical shift away from the failed policies and values of rebuilding Ireland in order to achieve this. An alternative policy path requires a reimagination of the state's role in delivering housing, placing it central once more to home building. It also requires a re-understanding and a reconceptualization of the fundamental role housing plays in our lives. Such a reconceptualization must be built upon the recognition that the treatment of housing and policy, public narrative, politics, and societal values as a financialized commodity, as Manuel has outlined, and as an investment asset, produces housing systems that are in constant crisis and entrenches and amplifies social and economic inequality. We must reconceptualize, revalue, and recreate housing into what it was for many years in this state and what it must become again as a home, a home that provides a secure base for our children, for our families, individuals and communities to develop and flourish, to be healthy and secure potential. And most importantly, we must do this to end the egregious ongoing violations, which they are of human rights of our citizens, the parents being forced to rear their children in inappropriate and developmentally damaging confines of hubs and hotels, families being evicted onto the street, 
Travellers shamefully ignored and excluded in substandard accommodation. Victims of domestic violence suffering because of the lack of an affordable home, an alternative affordable home. Migrants, loan parents and housing assistance payment recipients being discriminated against by landlords because we have handed social housing over to the inherent inequalities of the private market. The social costs of this crisis are immense, from a generation of children scarred by the adverse childhood experience of homelessness to the stress and anguish of housing insecurity. We do not measure accurately the scale of housing need in this country. We have 60,000 HAP recipients in insecure housing who are excluded from waiting lists. We don't count the hidden homeless. We don't measure the devastating impacts on self-esteem and delayed adulthood, the psychosocial impacts of homelessness and housing exclusion. But we must give hope to give a future to our locked out generations, to generation rent and generations stuck at home. We must renew and update the social contract of this Republic between citizens and the state that had at its foundation the state's responsibility, commitment and guaranteed delivery of an affordable, decent, quality, secure home for all. The COVID pandemic has shown once more how fundamental home is for our health and well-being. Housing is as fundamental as health and education. Yet the state invests 9 billion in education, 22 billion in health, and just 3 billion in housing. It's clear we need a transformation in how we approach housing. A new value framework and policy principles for our housing system and policy is required. This is, I believe, and should be the human right to housing, which must be inserted into the constitution to set a clear vision for our housing system and oblige the state to realize and uphold such a right. There are immediate things that can and should be done, to develop and implement a strategy to end homelessness, to triple capital investment in building public housing, to extend the eviction moratorium for two years, to tax vacant and derelict buildings, to remove the real estate tax break, and to hold the constitutional referendum on the right to housing immediately when COVID allows. That referendum offers a much needed societal debate on how we value home. And I believe with it will come a clear public assertion that it is the state and the country's core objective to ensure a home is available for all. It's the time for bold and radical steps. That's what this conference is trying to discuss and put out. It's the time for a new direction. It's the time to fix this housing and homelessness crisis, crisis permanently. Thank you for that. And I look forward, we look forward now to hearing the minister's presentation. So I invite the minister there now. Hi Rory, good morning. And uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Well, look, thank you very much, Rory. And uh, indeed, thanks for setting out the context of these discussions. And uh, I'm really pleased to be able to um, accept the invitation to have an input into the, the conference today and to set out some of my views and the position that I see us in right now and where we can move to in, into the future as a state. I think just a couple of initial remarks, if I may, based on, on, on your own um, uh, exposition of where you see the situation. It does outline the complexity of the problem that we have to face. And it does, we have to be honest that there is a housing crisis right now. Uh, and we need measures that are uh, realizable, realistic and implementable. And I actually am confident that we can make great strides in this area. But all of us have a responsibility in the Oireachtas, every party, every individual, and I would put it all stakeholders to be able to honestly put forward uh, realizable policies that are implementable and are deliverable. Um, and that we all share a responsibility to tackle the crisis and that we shouldn't and some should not see the crisis as just simply an opportunity to criticize or to make political gain. Uh, and I think we've got to be honest with our citizens too about what we can do. And we have the in my view, uh, very clearly the expertise, the know-how, the experience in many areas of what we need to do to fix this. And it won't be done overnight, but progress already, and I'll cover some of the details in my presentation, has been made particularly on legislation, because laws are important, policy direction is important, having those policies is crucially important, but then the further piece from that is actually implementing them, and that our citizens are seeing changes in those areas. One small example, if I could see, and you've rightly mentioned before I get into the meat of my own presentation to you, the area of homelessness. And it's the number one priority uh, for me as housing minister. I think for our society, to be fair, 
uh, you've outlined it there about how we feel as as citizens, uh, as as dads, as brothers, as you know, sisters, uh, when we see and hear of kids and families who are in emergency accommodation and people who are in long term systemic homelessness. I, I see it myself with in my own constituency too. But one needs to recognize then as well where we're making progress. So in the area of family and child homelessness, within an eight month period, but if we look at over a 12 month period, we've seen a substantial reduction, thankfully, of over 40% in homelessness in child and family. And we've also seen a very significant decrease in the number of families accessing or using hotels for emergency accommodation, but 75%. And we need to do a hell of a lot more, but we've also got to recognize through working with the NGOs to our partners in the, in the homeless sector who are doing an incredible job. And I've been out with them on outreach and I meet with them in my own homeless task force here in, in the department that I chair. Uh, that progress is being made and resources are being put behind it. And there shouldn't be criticisms that more money has been putting into homeless services. I find that quite uh, you know, strange in some instances that I see that because additional resources are being put into homeless services, that that's a failure. We need help involved in homelessness. And I've been ensured that we do that. We need wraparound care plans for those who have complex health needs, mental health needs, and also addiction. And sometimes in, in, in long-term homelessness, particularly for singles, that is systemic within there. So overall, we're about 19% down on homelessness, but the area of singles homelessness is still stubbornly high. And that is down to supply and type of properties that are available too, but also using our existing housing stock more appropriately and properly. And that's why last July, just to show you if there's a focus on things, when I published the July stimulus plan, that we looked at what vacant properties were there and what we could bring back into the system. So by setting individual targets for each of our local authorities all across the country, uh, in all of the 31 local authority areas, we were able to, in six months, bring, bring back 3,607 homes back into use, all of them allocated, and the vast majority of them now occupied. And we'll be doing that again. And we need to see how not only can we build and increase our public housing stock, which I firmly believe in, and I'm an absolute believer and advocate for public housing, is that using the stock that we have uh, better, managing it better, and when it's detenanted to make sure it's retenanted quicker. So I just wanted to maybe just uh, um, in the area of homelessness, not to, I know we're looking forward to what replaces Rebuilding Ireland, and I'll tell you my view on what is replacing it right now, but I just didn't want the discussion to end without, that is the number one for me. I would like though, look at today is an opportunity for me to really talk about the program for government. Uh, uh, and it has set out an ambitious and crucial housing commitments. And I've actually commenced the process, I'm right in the middle of it, of drafting a new vision to replace Rebuilding Ireland. Uh, and like the chapter in the programme for government that Rory, I'm sure you and, and viewers here on, on this conference and participants are familiar with, it will be called Housing for All, and it will be delivered on a whole of government basis. Because to tackle housing, it does need a whole of government uh, approach. The past 12 months, no doubt, uh, for everyone has been extremely challenging in the delivery of housing. Uh, the global pandemic has led to uh, major disruption in the construction sector, and that's just a fact that we have to deal with and get on with. And although hope is very much on the horizon and actually with us now in the, in the form of vaccinations, we do face short-term uh, challenges right now in relation to delivering and increasing our housing delivery with a 13 week shutdown in the sector this year on top of an eight week shutdown in the construction sector last year. Uh, the result of these breaks in delivery is that uh, it's more important than ever now that we collectively pro progress and indeed accelerate the necessary programs and look at all areas where we can accelerate them and reform to deliver homes to families and individuals, improve areas of policy that we feel will enable and enhance this aim. And I say it collectively because I mean that, as I said at the outset, there is no silver bullet. Uh, there's no one person, there's no one department, there's no one agency, no one idea is going to fix the housing crisis. It's a collective effort and it's a collective responsibility. Um, COVID has, as I said, had serious implications in relation to uh, housing supply in the short term, but I'm confident that we can make up for some of that lost ground as we did last year. Uh, last year after the shutdown, the middle of the year, 
Um, there was rightly comment with regard to where we were against target. We ended up just over 70% of target uh, in relation to social home delivery last year, which was, wasn't a bad um, uh, result at the end of the year. Um, but we need to look at this year. I managed to keep certain exemptions at the start of the year to focus on social housing delivery when construction was stopped because of the need to, to restrict the movement of people across the country, therefore suppressing the virus. But uh, work we have done in the national planning framework uh, forecast, as you'll know, means we'll have a population in Ireland of about 6 million by 2040. Uh, so we need to ensure that we address housing supply to accommodate that additional growth in the population, let alone what we have now already. Um, I commissioned uh, work recently from the ESRI um, looking at the NPF and we've settled on a figure that is widely accepted that we need approximately 33,000 homes per annum to keep up with population growth and demand. And that's both public and private. Um, if you look at 2014, we, the state only produced 14,000 homes in total in the country. There are only 14,000 homes delivered. Last year, progress was being made toward the back end of the year in, in improving supply. And the sector in general was on um, track to deliver about 25,000 homes. And then the before the impact of COVID restrictions actually impacted on delivery, but still it settles and based on CSO data on just short of 21,000 new homes, but about seven and a half thousand of those being uh, public homes. That wasn't nearly as bad as some of the commentators were predicting in the middle of the year. So it does show resilience within the sector within with, uh, to be able to make up for lost ground. Thankfully, through the lockdowns, though, as I said, we have managed to keep some social housing supply going. And as we start to emerge from the pandemic over the next few months, the focus will be absolutely getting that supply right back on track where it needs to be. Uh, and my quarter one um, output I'll have in the coming weeks, and that will give me a good idea for where we're projecting to the end of the year. Um, we have to ensure uh, that we help uh, the sector get back to work and create the right conditions for developments, both public and private, to take place in the right areas with the right standards. And we do need uh, both public and private working. We're not going to solve uh, the housing crisis without the private sector being involved, frankly. Uh, and we need that, but we need the state involved and in leading by example. We cannot um, solve the housing crisis and build the homes we need with one arm tied behind our back. But a big part of how we do that is to ensure that we continue to prioritize our own build program, our public housing building program. And budget 2021 has provided an unprecedented level of funding to deliver housing programs this year with 3.3 billion euro uh, available for housing delivery. We have committed in the program for government to increase in social housing stock by more than 50,000 over the period of the government with the key emphasis on delivering new builds. And that's already been a distinct policy change and which will be reflected in the Housing for All plan that I will talk about now in a moment. Um, we're ambitious to ramp up delivery at a local authority level, and we're committed, and I'm committed to developing public housing on public land. In September last year, I introduced a revised single stage approval process for capital expenditure on social housing um, for projects of up to 6 million. And that was again a commitment in the program for government. And it means that local authorities now will have greater autonomy in constructing social housing uh, leading to accelerated delivery. And in some of our metropolitan areas and our more populous local authorities, I may be looking at extending that single stage approval process to a greater amount, having seen the results of the, of the single stage process for the uh, projects of up to 6 million. Um, as I announced yesterday, actually, coincidentally, uh, I'm working on evaluating existing resources and expertise within local authorities, developing proposals to strengthen capacity and address resource, resource constraints at local authority levels. To give you an example, the area of project management. Um, that is an area from my visits to local authorities across the country that there does seem in some areas to be a dearth of resources, particularly on the construction side. So if we want to get our local authorities back building, which I earnestly want to do, we need to make sure that we're bridging the, the skills gap in those areas. So I will be publishing a, a skills plan and a, a resource plan for local authorities very soon. Thankfully, uh, though, and whilst the numbers on social housing list is far too high, 
absolutely far too high. There has been a significant decrease year on year of just short of 10%. We also need to look at those who are on HAP tenancies, absolutely. We've just uh, approximately 60,000, around 58,000 households supported by HAP. We can't just switch off that tap though. Uh, it is not, it was a short term measure that the state has become more dependent on and we need to start tipping the balance between HAP delivery and social housing delivery and moving people from that transfer list into, in, in, into permanent public homes. But I had to, in the budget of 2021, effectively allow for expenditure for a further 15,000 HAP tenancies. And I hope we don't need them all, but it's needed in the short term if we're gonna actually start reducing quickly the number of people who are homeless too. So it may be, as some might phrase it, a necessary evil. It, it's a short term measure. I don't see it, and I certainly don't use it as a subvention to the private rental market. I don't see it as it's providing homes for people in the short term, and we need to make sure that they're transitioning into, into permanent delivery. And that's why, you know, I, I again reiterate the ambitious targets backed by the largest ever housing budget that will deliver 12,750 new social homes in 12 months through build, mainly build 9,500, a small amount of acquisition because to allow for adapted homes and in some areas, some flexibility for acquisition and indeed leasing where, where it's appropriate, but the predominance of which 9,500. There have been, and I'm open to that, there is no difficulty criticism for lack of ambition in this area, but I would point to the fact uh, that this is the largest ever social housing build program in the history of the state in any given year, backed by the largest ever housing budget in the history of the state. And we've got to deliver on it. And what I want to see through housing for all, which I'll talk about in a moment, is how we can approach that on a multi-annual basis, because I believe we need that too. I do intend to publish our new housing plan, Housing for All, later this year. It will build on the commitments in the program for government. It will provide a real roadmap, a whole of government approach to outline how we get to a housing system that gives a sustainable supply that we need at a price that people can afford at the level of public housing that we need with the appropriate options, most importantly, for the most vulnerable in our society. To be successful and to make a coherent and lasting impact, the strategy will take into account not merely the delivery of the 33,000 homes per year, but also such complex and interrelated areas as homelessness, affordable home ownership, public and social housing, the Land Development Agency indeed, rent reform and planning uh, to name but a few. Um, we've actually recently uh, commenced the stakeholder consultation process for Housing for All and will be engaging with relevant stakeholders such as our approved housing bodies, local government construction sector, stakeholders on the on the homeless side as well, uh, with a view to bring that plan and, pub and publishing it this summer. It will contain targets, it will contain timeframes, and both of which will be vital to its success. And I think as importantly, it will provide a multi-annual approach. I think that is needed, certainly in, the pu in public house uh, building and certainly in the construction sector that we need it. One of the key challenges uh, is, and that's recognized by all, to be fair, is the challenge of affordability. Um, the government is committed to ensuring that affordable quality housing solutions are available to everyone in Irish society. And that's reflected really clearly in the program for government. It commits to putting affordability at the heart of the housing system through the progression of state-backed affordable housing. Uh, as you may be aware, I'm currently progressing the affordable housing bill through the Euroctus. Uh, it'll be, put, be brought to cabinet within the next two weeks it's concluded on pre-legislative scrutiny, and I intend to get it into the Dáil and Shannon in the coming months with a view to having it passed by the summer. It's a very significant piece of legislation, the first affordable housing bill brought forward by any government since the mid-2000s. Mid and that is backed by just short of 470 million euros secured in the budget specifically to cover affordability measures, which does also include funding for a new shared equity scheme. The scheme will be targeted towards eligible first-time buyers who are seeking to buy a new home, who cannot quite secure a full mortgage amount to do that. And subject to qualifying criteria, the schemes would actually see the state take a limited equity stake in the property in order to allow uh, purchasers to meet the total cost with the available mortgage. It will not be an additional mortgage, it will be an equity stake uh, within it. We do need to provide real hope to hard-working hard-pressed middle-income earners facing rents and 
high rents and purchase prices in Dublin, Cork and elsewhere in the country. We need to help first time buyers to purchase new starter homes. I want to stimulate confidence in the home purchase market of new builds, appropriate new builds after a protracted lockdown. And the scheme will allow many young people who are currently paying more in rent, sometimes double in rent, what they would be paying in a mortgage to buy their own home. Uh, I unambiguously believe in home ownership. I believe as a, as a housing tenure, it is a just and honest aspiration for someone to have. It's good for people. Uh, it's good for communities. And it should be supported by the state, as should the provision of public housing too. And I make no apologies for the scheme or the fact that I've prioritized affordability. There have been some criticism of it, and that is, that is to be welcomed and discussions around it. Uh, but there have been some criticisms of the scheme before it's been even published. And I think, it, I think anyone should really actually have a look and see what is in a scheme before they seek for a scheme to be scrapped. It is targeted, it is time bound, and it is one aspect of what, how we will deliver affordable homes. The other significant aspect of how we will do that is through a revised service sites fund. And that's something you spoke about in your introductory remarks, Rory, is about providing affordable homes on state-owned land, particularly on council land. The service sites fund is a good concept. It's been very slow though. Uh, it's 310 million euro that's in the fund. It would basically provide about 4,000 to 4,500 affordable homes uh, on public lands. And to give you an example, you know, where it is working well, um, and we're, we're going to expedite it and there'll be measures within the affordable housing bill and again in the, in the new housing for all plan, uh, how we speed up delivery in this. We just came recently um, announced in Dunima and Lusk that's supported by, uh, by the service sites fund through Fingal County Council. And house prices within that will be between 166,000 and 250,000, depending on the type of house. And that's the type of price we will see the first ones of the service sites fund affordable homes being delivered in Boca Boy and Cork as well uh, this year too, but we need to do more. Uh, and we have uh, a number of schemes allocated already, um, but we need to see them speed, speed up and expedite. And that's why I'll be bringing changes in the affordable bill to allow that to happen. I'm also committed to introducing cost rental and a new cost rental sector in Ireland. And I've discussed this with your, yourself before and many others. And it has a model, has been modeled on similar sectors that successfully provide affordable rental accommodation elsewhere in Europe. I'm actually really excited about this change. It's something that's been talked about for quite some time, but not delivered upon. And in the budget last year, uh, just last October for budget 2021, I secured 35 million to start this uh, and to ensure that that's backed now by a 100 million euro housing finance agency that on top of the Enniscary Road pilot, will be delivering 390 cost rental homes, uh, new tenancies um, and basically in Cork, the greater Dublin area and in Dublin initially. And this is a start to the scheme. And um, I actually see that, again, there was some saying, well, it's not enough. Of course, it's not enough. We've got to start the scheme somewhere and we've got to make sure that we have, we have the capacity to deliver it. So this will initially be delivered through our approved housing bodies uh, who have expertise in the area of estate management in particular. But I actually see this as an area for our local authorities and indeed our land development agency to be able to provide significant cost rental uh, homes at scale in a relatively short space of time. So what I'll be doing in the affordable bill also is publishing a national cost rental scheme along with the eligibility uh, um, regulations for that and the affordable purchase, which is sorely needed. And it's, it's, I think it will be great to have this new form of housing tenure for working people long-term secure rents, minimum 25% below open market rents that would just simply cover the cost of developing and managing uh, of those estates. In addition, um, as I said, we will be um, de delivering these homes through local authorities, land development agency as well. And I just want to touch very briefly on the land development agency and whatever one calls it. I think most people agree we need a state management agency and we need to manage our lands and manage them productively and use the lands that we, that we own ourselves productively. So I've brought forward a new bill um, based on the pre-legislative scrutiny that was held in the last Oireachtas that I partook in. Uh, and I've made sure that this bill is now passed second stage with the support of most, but not all parties uh, in the Dáil. It is an historic new agency. It, I firmly believe if set up correctly, which it is being done, it will be a driving force to deliver 
homes and affordable homes at scale. And it will ensure that we don't let state lands lie idle in the middle of an emergency. The LDA really does have the potential to be a game changer in making sure we use every acre of land owned by the state effectively. Uh, it will assess all state lands in our large towns. I see in population centers of over 30,000 in cities where it's needed, develop them mainly as affordable housing. And I'll be bringing some measures forward in the bill that will define exactly the amounts way above what some have been, have been saying. I've put affordability and local flexibility at the heart of the LDA bill rather than a one size fits all approach. Different parts of the country require different things and different solutions, a rigid approach. Uh, if that was set into legislation, can't respond to local affordability needs on an area by area basis. I've also put some significant changes in to ensure that the agency has CPO powers, limited enough at the start, but there, uh, having said that, it's fully subject to freedom of information and completely accountable to the Oireachtas so that every cent that's spent through the agency matters and is accounted for. Uh, no piece of legislation so, so large as this, and it is, you mentioned at the start that we are on a crossroads and a juncture here. I think most people would agree that we need to make sure we use our lands appropriately. So we need to manage that and we need an agency to do it. But certainly no uh, legislation of this size is going to uh, is, is, is going to meet approval by everyone. But I do hope there's engagement with regard to where people will see changes need to be made as this moves through the committee uh, process within the Dáil. And I would expect that it would be supported effectively by all parties in the Dáil if we're serious about providing affordable and public homes on state-owned land that's not being used at the moment. Um, finally, uh, in this section, just to say, you may be aware, and again, that I've recently announced my intention to increase the Part 5 provision in relation to privately built estates to protect the 10% social, but to add to that a requirement for 10% affordable. Uh, just br briefly, Rory, I'm conscious of time, and apologies, I've gone on a little bit longer than, than I thought, but I wanted to give you as in-depth uh, an insight in the a lot of time that I have. I want to turn to the rental sector, and it is a sector that is probably the most vulnerable sector for the people who are living within it, particularly the private rental sector, but it exists nonetheless, and we need to see how we can, how we can work uh, through the issues that are there. COVID-19 has caused significant economic difficulties, uh, impacting particularly on this sector, and particularly uh, tenants in low-income jobs, hospitality sector, retail sector. I've in introduced four pieces of legislation uh, to rental protections in under eight months. Um, the blanket moratorium on evictions does cease tomorrow, uh, but this does not mean uh, that, so, as some have said, that there will be a tsunami of evictions. Um, separate and targeted perfect protections for the most vulnerable tenants who are economically impacted by COVID and our rent arrears uh, will now and will continue to be, to be protected up until the 12th of July. And if we need any further measures brought forward, I will certainly do that. Tenants who meet the criteria uh, are required to make a self-declaration and our, that will be managed as well through the Residential Tenancies Board. No rent increase can apply uh, to their tenancy prior to this date. No rent increases can be retrospectively applied also. Also, and I really want to uh, emphasize this, it's really important to highlight that any tenant who finds herself or himself in difficulty paying their rent should apply to Department of Social Protection for the emergency rent supplement, which new rules were brought in place uh, to allow that and to simplify it. My department are gonna obviously continue to monitor the impact of COVID. Um, importantly though, as we look into the future, and this will form part of the housing for all plan, is looking at what, where we go post the, the uh, RPZ, the rent pressure zones. And I'm working on options in that regard. As you know, the rent pressure zones uh, are due to expire at the end of December. I think it does afford us an opportunity to see, well, how we can improve the lot for renters in the private market, uh, whilst recognising that there is uh, a right of the property owner there too, and also recognising the fact that about 86% of, of landlords out there are on one or two properties and are not institutional landlords. And we've got to watch that reason investor market, and I'm working on some elements within there about um, ring fencing for first time buyers also. In conclusion, Rory, and thanks for your, uh, for, for, for the time to talk to you. I do hope the, my overview here has given you um, 
some sense of the breadth of work that's underway to address what I feel are the key constraints in the housing uh, system and the steps we're taking uh, to develop a new housing plan, uh, which will be in the coming months. I expect that to be in the summer months to deliver more homes across all tenures, public, affordable, uh, affordable rental as well. Uh, we've acted quickly to remove some of the blockages, uh, improve efficiencies and increase autonomy of some of the stakeholders to deliver. More needs to be done in that space. Uh, I've listened intently to suggestions and indeed to criticisms and have put forward record levels of funding to back new initiatives. Uh, and I'm continuing to be open, very open to doing that. In the form of our new affordable housing bill and the Land Development Agency bill, uh, we're in the process of introducing a whole new form of tenure that in my view will really help bridge the gap between affordability for affordability for many families. Our new housing strategy, Housing for All, can and will bring together the interdependent factors ranging from land to spatial planning, to needs assessment, uh, which is crucially important as well, in a way that's never been achieved before. And whilst doing so, we need to continue to protect the welfare of tenants and homeowners amidst the uncertainty of the current pandemic. But we need to make sure that the plan that we publish uh, is deliverable, uh, is time bound and is implementable. So thank you, Rory, and thanks, colleagues, for the opportunity to talk to you. I'll stay on for as long as I can uh, to okay, listen okay. To, to others, but I'm due in the Department of Finance around a quarter to 11. So thank you. Great. Listen, I really appreciate that, uh, Dara. And um, I, I just one quick question before I do hand over to the, the panel. Um, and I know you will uh, intently listen back on Reboot Republic your favourite podcast to... Uh, I think I'm coming on with you next week, I think. You are because, indeed. Because Tony has, been, Tony's been hounding me, but yes, I will be on. It is my favourite podcast. Um, but listen to the panellists' presentations. But a question, just yeah. one question before I hand over to the uh, panellists. Um, on the right to housing, obviously home, mm -hmm. a human right is a key theme of this conference. Where do you see that uh, fitting into the plan and, and in terms of progressing that referendum yeah. on, on putting the right to housing in the constitution, which, um, you know, civil, the cross... Uh, across civil society feels that that's necessary now and we know why it's necessary too. I feel it's necessary too, Rory. I want to be very clear about it. it there is a commitment to hold referendum, a referendum on housing. I also intend to e establish the Commission on Housing, which I've had some engagement with many stakeholders in, in the sector too. I think it's important. Firstly, I'll answer the referendum piece in more detail in a second. Commission on Housing, I believe, will give us an opportunity to have a transgovernmental approach to housing. So that we're not just change, chopping and changing with every government uh, as well, because I think we need some certainty and uh, a trajectory that's going to be effectively that will transcend different elections and different governments and indeed different ministers within governments. So I intend to establish a commission on housing and to put out for ex expressions of interest this year. I think that would be important. I would expect the commission and the subsector within it to be looking at the legislative and constitutional proposals to bring them forward uh, with regard to a right to housing in our constitution. Um, I believe that we should do that. Uh, there is a commitment there. We need, there will be work to be done to pass a referendum such as that I think you'll, you'll appreciate too. Um, so the Joint Directors Committee, this came up actually uh, earlier this week at the Joint Directors Committee on Housing. Um, I intend to, to make good on that commitment. Referendum this year won't be possible. We need to do a bit of work on it. I've met, uh, you know, Home for Life and others, uh, indeed, um, who, um, you know, that, that who have different views. And Mercy Law Centre, who've done a lot of really good work on this, looking at across across other jurisdictions, what constitutional and indeed legislative supports to the right to housing are in place. So yes, we're going to progress it, Rory. I see it being progressed through the Commission on Housing that would report to me working with the Joint Directors Committee. I want to see it progressed and I want to see it in the Constitution. Great, thanks, Minister. I really appreciate Sorry. your time. No, okay. And I'm going to hand over now to our first presenter uh, as response to the Minister, which is uh, Associate Professor at Trinity College Dublin, Dublin economist um, PJ Drudy and long-term housing expert. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Minister. Nice to hear you. 
Um, good morning. And good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to hear the minister. I must say, the sort of things he's been saying is music to my ears. I remember, we cannot blame him, by the way, for anything to do with Rebuilding Ireland, because I remember very well when Rebuilding Ireland was published first in 2016, he was quite critical. And uh, he was certainly saying the right things when he was in opposition. And the sort of things he said this morning, I must say, I'm impressed by a whole, whole of government approach. We need the private sector, but we must prioritize social housing, uh, public housing on public land, phase out HAP, cost rental. I mean, he said all the right things, really. And I wish him well in delivering his new vision. Certainly, uh, it sounds exciting. You're excited by it, which is very important and enthusiastic about housing. I think you always have been, in fairness to you. But uh, looking at, uh, have I my slides now? Can I ask my expert in there to perhaps show the slides and bring me on to uh, the first slide, please? Uh, that's grand. Just to the problem really, the minister mentioned supply, and of course it is a problem. Uh, 1975, we produced the uh, private sector, 18,000 homes, the public sector, 8,700 homes. Uh, 2005, just around the time or before the crisis, massive numbers of homes being produced by the private sector, many of them unfortunately in the wrong places. Ghost estates emerged after that and so on. Uh, the public sector was down from what it was in 1975, and that was unfortunate and is still unfortunate. But the private sector has not emerged since 1975, down around 15,000 homes. Now, I've only given you 2019. The minister mentioned 2020, 21. They're much the same. The totals are around the same, 20,000, 21,000. Uh, unfortunately, the private sector has not delivered. I accept the point made by the minister that the private sector is important, of course, but it's not delivering. I think there's a lot of drip feeding of houses onto the market, expensive executive type housing uh, that people can't afford really. So I mean, uh, there's blockages there in the private sector. They're not delivering at the moment. As regards the public sector, look over to the right hand side of the slide. Um, it's quite, it's, it's inadequate really. Unfortunately, the local authorities are only providing about 1,500 of those. Housing associations, the AHBs, uh, somewhat more about double that. And in there are acquisitions. There's a fair amount of acquisitions of homes still taking place and that's unfortunate and that's a problem. And part five, part five and acquisitions. And I remember the minister years ago, uh, we talked about the idea of turnkey housing and in his view, um, these figures were illustrating, or were not illustrating actually, that turnkey was a key element and that the private sector was producing these houses. So I think basically on the supply side, there's a real problem. So go on to the next slide, please. If I may, or is somebody going to do it for me good? The result of all this lack of supply, and everybody knows this, is um, escalating prices. All right, they came down for a very short period of time after the crash, but there have been consistently up since then. Now, I haven't shown 19 and 20 because in fairness, they have slowed down slightly, but not that much. And in parts of the country, they're actually still very, very high in double digits. So escalating prices is the problem really. Now, despite, I should say, a lot of encouragement from the government, the likes of fast track planning, help to buy scheme, which in, in was not uh, introduced by uh, Minister O'Brien, by the way, it was introduced previously by a former finance minister. Uh, help to buy is an unfortunate scheme in that it escalates demand. And if you increase demand, you increase prices. Now, I don't know whether the minister is going to do anything about that into the future, but I think it's an unfortunate scheme as was introduced in England many years ago by George Osborne. It had the same effect of simply helping to increase prices. So my next slide, please, because I've only got a short time on this. Um, the private rental. Well, the minister again mentioned this. I think at the moment, rentals are unaffordable. There are monopoly elements, as Manuel Albert uh, said earlier on, uh, and there's still insufficient protection for tenants. I mean, tenants can be evicted at relatively short notice for 
if the landlord wishes to acquire the, the property or whatever. There's various uh, difficulties in that really. I believe there was undue reliance in rebuilding Ireland on private landlords to provide social housing. And I think that is still the situation. And But I am glad to hear uh, the minister say that HAP and RAS and so on would be phased out. I think that's very important because we're spending large sums of money, about a, about a billion to private landlords. And really it is very costly and it is not delivering a single home for that in the longer term. And in fair to the minister. That is what he was hinting at in his, in his presentation. And of course, institutional buyers are a problem for us, rather, buying large amounts of the private rental sector. They're virtually a monopoly in some areas of Dublin now. And they charge very large rents. And they crowd out normal purchasers. So our part, entire apartment blocks are purchased by these uh, institutional investors. Call them vulture funds, call them what you want, but they are heavily involved in investing large sums of money in old apartment blocks mainly. And when an entire apartment block consisting perhaps of 50, 100, 200 apartments, the normal buyer is excluded. And of course, that in itself reduces the supply and increases prices. So problematic really. Next slide, please. And thank you for helping me on this. The solution is very simple. I believe a key role for the state government and in fairness this is what the minister seems to be saying councils housing associations the housing agency housing co-ops to play key roles and i have no doubt that the minister will really realize that these can play a key role there's a lot of expertise in there and he's going to increase the expertise in the local authorities which is absolutely important and they can deliver we delivered it in the 1940s and 1950s when we had nothing we can, despite our debt, which is enormous now, we can still do it. So sufficient uh, public zoned land is available for large numbers of homes. I won't give you numbers now, but I suggest, I've suggested many times over the last 20 years, 10,000 uh, for waiting list applicants per annum and 10,000 self-financing cost rent. And I'm delighted to hear the minister focus on that because cost rental, there's large, large numbers of people in the private rented sector now. They are not eligible for public housing and they are really being charged extortionate rents and they're, they're insecure and so on. Very little protection. So I think this is a routing that the minister is going to travel and I'm absolutely thrilled about that. And again, I'm pleased about phasing out HAP because really it is very costly. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. So again, land is a key requirement indeed. Use state land for social and affordable. Do not sell off. Acquire if you can, in fact, Minister. Uh, and tax land holding. It's, it won't be very popular with, with some people in the business, but really, if, if people are holding land, they shouldn't be allowed to do so, really. And a significant uh, vacant site levy. That's very difficult to administer, as you will know. Uh, it's not easy people will appeal, 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 and so on. I know quite a number of people. I have lots of friends in the development industry, by the way, just in case you think I'm, I'm having a go at them. But really, they tell me that they can stall this for quite a while. Terminate, I think this is important, terminate help to buy scheme, because really it does increase house prices. I, and I don't think there's any real rationale for it. I would say, you mentioned rent regulation earlier, Minister. I would say expand rent regulation on a national basis rather than trying to mess around with the pressure zones. And I would accept that rent regulation in the longer term may not be necessary if we have a proper housing policy. But in the short term, I think it is justified. I'm one of the few people who has argued for rent regulation. And I'm not talking about rent control here, by the way. Very important distinction between rent control, which would freeze rents, and rent regulation, which would allow a reasonable increase in uh, the price of rents on an annual basis. Now, 4% is high in comparison with the consumer price index at the moment, but certainly I accept the principle. I would say lower than 4% personally. I would stop the acquisition of private homes by local authorities. I think that is unfortunate, or by housing associations, because all it does is you're in, con in direct competition with young buyers and it increases prices. So again, Oh, I'm almost suggesting some market solutions here, that we play the market game. 
if you want to win this battle. Now, next slide, please. Can I have that next slide, please? Now, I think I'm, I'm almost finished anyway. Oh yes, cost rental is there now, sorry. Go back to cost rental. Minister mentioned this, he's in favor of it, obviously. So I won't deal with it in any detail, but it can be self-financing. The state borrows the money on a long-term basis, and then the tenant pays enough to cover the construction costs, the maintenance, the interest, and so on. So it is actually, it can be self-financing, and rents can be well below market prices. And I'm not talking about 80% of a market price. It has to be way, way down, at least half, I would say. So state-owned land would be used. But if the state can acquire more land, this is a win-win scheme. I promise you. The Irish government can get the finance relatively easily. Now, housing finance agents, the European Investment Bank, you borrow very, very cheaply, as the minister knows. Next slide, please. So the impact, well, more affordable homes. And I don't mean affordable in relation to market prices because they won't be affordable if they're just 80% of the market prices. They have to be way down. Uh, Rory mentioned the Gohulan Cooperative earlier on. They are building houses for around 250,000 for um, a three bed semi. That's assuming they get the land and assuming they don't pay levies. But certainly houses can be built at a reasonable price by the state. We have a good deal of evidence now that the state can produce quite affordable homes. And the beauty of it is that if the state gets seriously involved, you're in competition with property developers, which is competition is a good idea, you reduce house prices. Again, if you have the cost rental one, for example, you're in competition with private landlords, rents will have to come down or stabilize at the very least. And of course, create significant employment in the building industry. And no doubt the minister, as well as the other ministers are desperate for employment. And of course, savings. You save on the help to buy scheme, you save on the likes of rent supplement, which is almost gone, I think, on RAS and on HAP. Win, win situation. Next slide, please. And that is it. Reinstate housing as a home and a human right. Financialization and commodification, unfortunately, have been seriously problematic. We must try to move away from that. We must move away from that. And thank you very much indeed for listening to me. Thanks, PJ, uh, once again, for a wonderful overview and um, presentation. And we're just going to move on now. Um, and it'll be hopefully a bit of time to come back with Q&A uh, before we finish this session. We're going to move on now to Karen Murphy from um, the Irish Council for Social Housing. Um, I'm going to provide her presentation and response. Thanks a million, Karen, for being part of it today. Thanks, Rory. Uh, appreciate that. Um, and thanks for the invitation to join you this morning. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen um, to open my presentation. If you can just bear with me uh, a couple of seconds. Sorry. Just looking for the presentation here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think your timing is excellent, Rory. Um, judging by the, the phase that the, the Minister has said he's in the consultation phase, which we are partaking um, on, on Housing for All. So I think in terms of your, your timing for this conference, you're spot on in relation to, um, I suppose, developing the, the sort, sort of the, the, the basis for, for the um, Housing for All plan, which as we see, it's a critical importance to how we want to see our housing system develop. So at the end of Rebuilding Ireland, we can take a step back and see, well, what did it achieve? What, you know, was this the direction of travel that we wanted to take with the, with the sort of a, a huge investment program and huge engagement of stakeholders? So at the start of a new plan, I think it's, it's you know, of critical importance that we consider where we want to go with, um, with this new plan. I'm just literally trying to share my <laughs> presentation here and it's refusing to appear. Um, if you can just give me two seconds. Take your time, Karen. That's fine. Yeah, I'm just. It's. It, I had it earlier, and it's disappeared off the um, 
off the screen so just we can... while, while you're working on that if you want me to i can read out some of the comments well sure yeah that'd be great yeah yeah so thomas um asked you know will the housing for all uh plan include a section on implementing the recommendations of the expert group on traveler accommodation rebuilding ireland was entirely silent on traveler accommodation um councillor alison gilliland said the minister indicated he fully supports the aspiration of people to own their own homes However, current planning legislation is facilitating an exponential increase in build to rent developments, which in her view is also contributing to the increase in home purchase prices. And she's absolutely correct about that and only provides more insecure housing for rent and of course, more unaffordable rental as well, um, as you say, that aren't affordable. Um, and then we also have um, Alice uh, asked to what extent will students and affordable student housing be included in the new plans by the minister the 2017 national student accommodation strategy highly encouraged and facilitated the provision of student accommodation by the private sector again investors uh, which has become vastly unaffordable for many um, and the um nessa nika Sorja said the minister uh 25 below market rates for cost rental is still unaffordable um, and it seems that a national cost rental model may only become affordable if done on a large scale led by the state using public land and large scale upfront subsidies and ambitious borrowing levels. If you don't plan to do this, how can cost rental become affordable? Any look there, Karen? Unfortunately not. Um, <laughs> okay, I might do you just, want to just talk through that? It's just disappeared. So I'll just talk through it, Rory, yeah, without perfect. the presentation, Great. if that's okay. People yeah, bear absolutely. with me. Yeah. I might refer to an invisible presentation the odd time, so apologies no if problem. I do. So, no problem. Um, yeah, I suppose maybe just starting by reflecting on what was in Rebuilding Ireland, because there are still enduring problems and major gaps. And I suppose we can look back and say, yes, during Rebuilding Ireland, more social homes were built. Um, however, there was a huge over-reliance on HAP, and I think the Minister has referred to that, and PJ has referred to that, so I very much welcome those comments. Um, I suppose the other major challenges throughout Rebuilding Ireland and that still persist are the high cost of both construction and land. Um, so I suppose there, there are major challenges for the new plan and I think the, the Minister and all of the people working on it really need to consider how do we tackle those high costs um, to make, I suppose, housing for all uh, more realisable. Um, again, under Rebuilding Ireland, we saw, yes, there's less people on the housing waiting list um, after five years. However, we still have a, a very significant housing need problem. Um, the housing demand is enduring and it's not just social housing. It's people in the private rented sector who are paying basically unaffordable rents and living on very little else um, after they've paid their rent. Um, also under Rebuilding Ireland, we saw some progress on rental reforms, um, including the move to six year rental cycles. However, I think that hasn't gone far enough. And also the affordability problem in the private rented sector um, is one of the, I suppose, single issues that need to be tackled. And again, I welcome the Minister's comments on cost rental and that's um, and PJs. And that's certainly a large part of what I wanted to talk about was the need for um, more cost rental as a tenure in itself. Um, some other improvements that were brought in under Rebuilding Ireland included um, higher energy standards for new construction. However, we have people in existing housing who um, need retrofitting. And also that's a significant target in the Climate Action Plan. And I suppose those energy standards need to be significantly ramped up um, in our existing housing stock from both a fuel poverty and, and a climate perspective. The minister mentioned the service site fund and LIHAF, which yes, there were some improvements, but I would agree it was slow, very slow to get off the ground. Um, and that's that's a sort of a key, um, I suppose, measure that we need to focus on in housing for all. In terms of land assembly, I think strategic land assembly, both state land and private land um, will have to be tackled. and. If there, there is a role for the LDA, as the minister outlined, um, I think it needs to go further than that. Yes, we should absolutely be delivering on state land and we should be delivering affordable social housing, um, cost rental housing on state land. But I think also there, there will be need for a more strategic 
um, direction in relation to land assembly and land access if we are to tackle the cost of land. Um, so that's key to that. In terms of homelessness, um, some measures um, did take off, such as housing first and young care leavers um, entering. Uh, there was a CAST programme, a, a new sort of housing programme for young care leavers, which um, to some degree have um, taken hold. However, family homeless is still a huge problem. It has been hidden to a large degree at the moment by the COVID crisis. Um, so I think we are going to see that re-emerge as, a, as a, an enormous problem um, post COVID and the eviction ban. Again, as the minister mentioned, there are some protections that are continued on into July, but I think there is, there is, a, there, there is a, a also other evictions that can take place between now and then. So I think that's something that we need to absolutely tackle in housing for all. Uh, I suppose some of the other measures in rebuilding Ireland, there was quite a lot of focus on acceleration measures, for example, public private partnerships, revolving funds. Um, I think what we found was a lot of acceleration measures didn't particularly speed anything up. Um, so I, again, there's a lot of learning from those processes and uh, I suppose a lot of engagement across sectors required um, under housing for all. So I suppose that moving on from reflecting on rebuilding Ireland into the new plan, what, what is it that we want to see? Um, what do we want to see at the end of the new plan, I think is the question we need to ask. Um, so I suppose the housing for all is a five year plan from what I understand. However, in my view, we need a 10 to 20 year vision to guide that plan. I think five years is a relatively short period of time within um, if you're trying to transform a housing system. And I think that's what we should be doing. We're looking for a transformative plan here, not just, you know, adding units kind of on a year by year basis. So we need a 10 to 20 year vision guiding um, the first five years of that. Um, another learning from rebuilding Ireland is that implementation. So you can have a great plan, but it's the implementation that will knock you back. So I think we need to have a huge focus on implementation measures. Um, and I suppose specialist measures as well, because I, rebuilding Ireland was enormous in its entirety, um, you know, dozens and dozens of actions. And it's sometimes I think maybe if we could just simplify that down and not be experimenting all the time, if we can agree with what we really want to see um, and try and focus and specialise to, to realise that. Um, I suppose the, the two, two main aspects I would like to see are construction costs and land costs and reducing the reliance on HAP. And how do we do that? In my view, it's by increasing the percentage of social housing stock and um, this cost rental. So at the moment we have very, very few, um, I suppose we, ha we have a pilot approach to the cost rental scheme at the moment, which is very welcome and approved housing bodies are, you know, very, very, I suppose, excited and um, delighted to be involved in the pilot scheme this year, but we would like to see that significantly um, increased over the sort of the coming period. Um, I, you know, I was looking, I had a lovely diagram looking at the Rebuilding Ireland HAP um, targets and the targets that were set was, I think it was 96,000 units and to date around 85,000 um, have been delivered under HAP um, within Rebuilding Ireland. So I think if you're going to set high targets for particular measures, that's that's what you'll end up with. So after five years, we've placed 85,000 households into um, basically short term private sector tenancies. So I think we need to flip that and really consider um, how we can, I suppose, prioritise both social housing and cost rental in our new plan in this housing for all. Um, and that, that's not going to be, I suppose, simple. And as the minister has said, he's recognised he's had to put forward or to put aside a certain portion of the budget for 2021 for HAP. Um, but I think we need to really focus on scaling that back over the coming years. Um, there, there's also other uh, red flags that we need to consider. And this is going maybe beyond social housing, but in the private rented sector, um, maybe what we're not going, what, what we didn't consider 
at the start of rebuilding Ireland and what, what has crept in is the real, invest, real estate investment trusts and also the build to rent sector. And these are the fastest growing, um, I suppose, se sectors in the likes of the US and the UK. Um, and I think we really need to consider what role and what percentage of our housing we'd like to see um, under those forms of tenure in the coming years. Uh, so I suppose maybe just thinking about the targets and the priorities for me, I suppose that the 50,000 social housing, I would like to see that as a minimum figure. Um, I think we need to have a target for cost rental so that we can actually put in place the measures that we need to achieve it and, and the budget. Um, I think homelessness needs to be absolutely prioritised and mainly through a housing response, um, obviously with other targeted measures as well, but I suppose it's all around providing the supply. Um, urban and rural regeneration, I, I, I mean, I'm in so many areas that you could talk about um, in looking at um, housing for all, but I do think we need a specific focus on urban and town and village regeneration to utilise the existing um, I suppose brownfield development and uh, vacant sites that can be re revitalized. Um, another area of rebuilding Ireland that I felt could have really progressed more was around purpose built housing for older people and people with disabilities. Um, so I'd like to see that really tackled in housing for all. Uh, we support the minister on the part five um, announcement around reintroducing the 20%. So I think that would be very positive. Um, and I suppose from an AHB perspective, we'd like to see the classification status of AHB tackled to return us to a, an on, off balance sheet um, situation. So, it's, I mean, maybe just to finalise, Rory, um, where we go with these targets. Um, at the moment, local authority and approved housing body stock is approximately 11% of all occupied housing stock. So I suppose setting a base target um, of 20% of all occupied housing for social and cost rental uh, within the coming years to me would be, um, I suppose, a conservative approach, but one that would start to slowly transform the housing system into one where affordability and accessibility for all um, is at the heart. So I think approved housing bodies um, can absolutely contribute to delivering on this kind of a plan. Uh, we have a track record in social housing and not just delivery, but also management. Um, we are key partners in tackling homelessness and then providing for other special needs housing. At the moment, AHBs have about 14,000 homes in the pipeline. So in terms of capacity and skills, we can absolutely um, deliver more and I suppose upscale on on those 14,000 homes um, if the targets and ambition is there to for AHBs to share in that. Um, so I suppose I had a number of pictures of lovely schemes to show you which um, demonstrated some of the work but I think a lot of people have probably seen that over time. So I think maybe the, the core point is you know what do we want the housing system to start to look like at the end of housing for all. Thanks very much Rory. Thanks, Karen. I um, really appreciate that. And it is a really um, interesting overview. And I think you're raising that question of the longer term uh, vision and where do we want to go with our housing system is really, really fundamental. And I think, um, you know, setting a 20 percent target, I think I feel myself we should be going for 30 percent, but at least, you know, putting a target there for, you know, where we want to get to and is, is fundamental and how do we you know, really transform the housing system. And of course, it's very positive as well to hear, you know, AHBs are, as you say, 14,000 units in the pipeline, but potentially, of course, if the funding was made available and resourcing and supports, you could be doing, you know, even more. And it just shows that the solutions are there. And um, I know many of the schemes that you're working on and your members are working on, which are, which show it can be done. Absolutely. We can build you know, social and affordable housing and particularly targeted at those uh, who need them, like people with disabilities as well. I think that's such an important thing and older people as well in creating inclusive communities. So really appreciate you, Karen, for that. Uh, and now I'm going to bring in um, Ono Brin, who is the Sinn Féin um, TD and housing spokesperson and author of Home, Why Public Housing is the Answer, which is the uh, second best book on housing 
in Ireland if you want to <laughs> have a read. Um, and uh, delighted to have Owen uh, as part of the conference. Owen has done a huge amount of work in the area of housing and proposing alternatives and of course engaged at a local level as both a councillor and a TD um, in uh, South Dublin. And I'm going to hand over it now to Owen. Thanks very much, Rory, and uh, you're absolutely right. Um, PJ Drudy's uh, uh, book uh, on housing is far, far better than mine. I think we can all uh, agree on that. Look, first of all, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, and this is, as always, a hugely important topic for us to be discussing, uh, and one that, unfortunately, I suppose, because of the, the very stark realities of COVID, uh, has receded somewhat in, in terms of the media debate, but not necessarily in the importance to people's lives. Now, I want to touch on three things and try and keep to about 10 minutes, Rory, if that's okay, uh, so we have some time for, for Q&A. And the first, I suppose, is just to say Rebuilding Ireland is coming to an end uh, this year, and, and notwithstanding uh, uh, Karen's points around some of the uh, uh, small areas of progress, the, the core point we have to make about Rebuilding Ireland is it was an abject failure. Um, if you look through each of the five pillars uh, and what each of those pillars set to do, in almost every respect it failed. Homelessness is higher than it was at the outset. Social housing need is higher than it was. Uh, houses are less affordable to rent or buy. The private rental sector is as dysfunctional as ever. Uh, and the uh, bringing back into use of vacant homes, which was the forgotten pillar five of the plan, uh, is, is a, a stark reminder. If I have one criticism of PJ Drudy, and it's very rare that I would I would criticise PJ, he's far too generous to Fianna Fáil and the Minister. Um, rebuilding Ireland was as much Fianna Fáil's housing plan under confidence and supply as it was Fine Gael's. They were involved in the negotiations directly with it, and in fact year on year they were involved in the negotiations of the budget which underpinned it, uh, and in many occasions the kinds of legislation uh, that uh, uh, failed uh, uh, miserably to promote a human right to housing, Fianna Fáil either supported or that they abstained on. Similarly, they abstained on budgets and they abstained uh, on motions of no confidence. So I don't think we should let uh, uh, the current minister as his party off the hook for, for where we are uh, today. I suppose the real question, however, is, is what is in the programme for government uh, uh, and what has happened in the first year or almost the first year of this new government? Uh, I absolutely do not accept the Minister's contention that there has been any profound change in housing policy. Um, there might be a change in rhetoric, uh, uh, but that is a very different thing. And if you look carefully at the programme for government, it really represents a continuation of the same core uh, policy consensus that has been in place pretty much since the start of the 1990s. And that's an over-reliance on the private sector to meet social and affordable housing need, uh, uh, far too much focus on, on fiscal supports, uh, supply side measures and direct grant aid to private developers and very very little levels of real uh, investment in, in non-market housing led by local authorities approved housing bodies community housing trusts uh, uh, or, or others there are i suppose three uh, uh, changes and we have to name those the first is is the shared equity uh, loan scheme uh, which really i suppose brings us back to the bad old days of of Fianna Fáil, fanning the flames of, uh, of what is already emerging as a property bubble in certain respects, a, a widely criticised scheme that should be scrapped uh, irrespective of the finer details if and when the minister uh, publishes them. It's also the case, in fact, that Fianna Fáil uh, made the help to buy scheme even worse by increasing it up to 10% and, and uh, 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 300,000. Uh, and again, that has already had an impact in increasing house prices. The LDA, LDA legislation has changed significantly, although I'm not convinced that it has improved. And in fact, uh, I thought it was intriguing that John Moore and the outgoing chair of that organization uh, was quite critical of the government uh, for dampening down the ambition, as he called it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people who are unclear as to what the direction of travel of the LDA is going to be from the very private sector orientated model uh, of Fine Gael. Uh, what we do know, however, is public land will be used for non-public uh, uh, homes and unaffordable private sale homes. Uh, and we also know that its, its target outputs are greatly diminished and it will be some years before it starts to produce any number of properties. But then really when, when we're talking about public homes and when we're arguing that uh, uh, the reinsertion of the state uh, uh, to drive social affordable housing delivery is, is the key policy platform of government, the proof of the pudding is in the money. Um, you can uh, say as many times as you like as a minister uh, that you want more public homes, that you want more cost rental homes. 
but unless you are matching that with the necessary levels of investment in the budget, uh, then that rhetoric is simply that rhetoric that has no meaning in terms of improving the quality of people's lives and their access to secure and affordable accommodation. Uh, and what did the budget give us uh, uh, for this year? It, it only gave us an extra 124 million for social housing that added 593 units on top of the pre-existing Fine Gael targets. That is nowhere close to meet the need uh, uh, of social housing that's out there. Uh, and a measly 35 million for cost rental. And look, every uh, Minister for Housing since Alan Kelly in 2014 has talked to talk on cost rental, but no government to date has heeded the advice of PJ, who's been a, a, a long standing advocate uh, of this uh, form of housing, or indeed the National Economic and Social Council, the housing agency, the ESRI. We need cost rental on scale, and I'll come back to that uh, in, in a moment. I suppose really for me that the two concerns I have with this government are, are that growing gap between rhetoric and reality. And, and let's just respond to a couple of the comments that the, the minister uh, made. He said that homelessness is his priority uh, and he rightly uh, highlighted the fact that uh, we've seen uh, for the first time in quite some time a substantial reduction in the number of families with children in emergency accommodation, albeit we are seeing an increase in adults. The sole reason for that is the pandemic uh, uh, and particularly the initial blanket ban uh, on evictions notice to quit and rent increases. Dara is right, he's introduced four pieces of uh, rental tenancy uh, legislation, all of which progressively stripped the protections that uh, uh, the Oireachtas unanimously agreed in the early stages of COVID. And while I don't expect to see a tsunami of homeless presentations starting from tomorrow, my worry is, and I think this is a worry shared by many people working on the front line of homeless services, is we will start to see a reversal of the pandemic trend downwards and a slow, steady, incremental increase in families with children presenting. It is not true to say the most vulnerable tenants have been protected by this legislation, the very opposite. And therefore, or I don't see how any uh, uh, minister in this government can say homelessness is a priority. Uh, likewise, for example, the minister says he's uh, 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 increased the threshold for the single stage approval process for the delivery of social homes, and that will increase uh, the speed with which they're delivered. There are only 11 units included in that change. It is the most minimalist uh, 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 change in terms of the overwhelming bureaucracy imposed by the Department of Housing, both on local authorities and approved housing bodies. Likewise, the minister is not correct that social housing uh, uh, need is diminishing. In fact, it's increasing very significantly. Yes, the social housing waiting list of local authorities is reduced, but that's because every time somebody goes on HAP, they're removed from that list, uh, likewise with RAS. So in fact, when you add the three lists, HAP, RAS and uh, local authority waiting lists, we have 140,000 people in need of long-term secure uh, social housing. The government is only committed to producing 50,000 over the next five years, and that doesn't take into account new entrants onto the list, which can be somewhere between 7,000 and 14,000 households uh, uh, annually. And likewise, the minister can say all he wants, that he wants to reduce uh, the over-reliance on HAP. But in fact, we now have 100,000 households and rental subsidies between HAP, RAS, uh, and rent supplement uh, and long-term leasing. And you can only reduce the reliance on uh, rental subsidies if you increase the supply of social housing. Those two things don't match. And therefore, until we see uh, the minister's plan and whether he intends to move beyond the 10,000 uh, real social homes a year, it'll be difficult to know. Two final things, I suppose, on, on the minister's plan, and then I'll, I'll give a few final concluding comments in terms of what I think the alternative needs to be. It took Fine Gael 100 days to produce Rebuilding Ireland. Uh, while I disagreed with many of the policy aspects of it, it was a comprehensive plan. It had a, a multi-annual budget and multi-annual targets. Uh, the minister is taking a year to produce a plan, um, and I suspect that plan won't have multi-annual uh, budgetary commitments. It might have targets in some ways, and that concerns me. Likewise, I welcome the shift in Fianna Fáil's position uh, to now supporting a, a referendum on constitutional right to housing, uh, but Fine Gael don't support that, uh, and therefore the real question is not where, whether Darrell O'Brien individually will say he supports it or not uh, at a conference, it's whether this government is united in wanting such a referendum. Kicking it into a housing commission which could debate it for a year uh, it means that the thing gets delayed rather than dealt with. And therefore, I have a concern that <clears throat> some of the minister's rhetoric, and to call me a cynic about uh, ministerial preferences and promises, is more about saying the right thing but delaying action rather than taking the kind of urgent uh, action uh, that we need today. And I suppose the, 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 the biggest gap between rhetoric and reality is the minister can say what he wants, he believes in home ownership. 
home ownership has uh, fallen most dramatically under Fianna Fáil governments. Uh, and if you continually increase the cost of buying a home through supply side measures like help to buy, <coughs> excuse me, uh, or the shared equity loan scheme, uh, in fact, home ownership will continue to diminish. So what do we need to do that's different? What, what does that long-term vision that Karen rightly outlined uh, uh, look like? Well, the first thing is we need a paradigm shift. We need to stop tinkering around the edges and making small policy changes. And we need to say that we want in 10 to 15 years, uh, we want 30% of our housing stock to be non-market, social rental, affordable cost rental, and affordable leasehold uh, purchase. And the only way we can do that is first of all, uh, by enshrining the right to housing in the constitution and winning that crucial public debate. But also then at a minimum, doubling capital investment in the direct delivery uh, of good quality public homes uh, for a wide variety of income groups, uh, which would include social rental, affordable cost rental, uh, and affordable leasehold purchase. That means we would be looking at an annual target output of about 20,000 uh, units over uh, five years uh, of government. And therefore, the housing plan needs to show us. They need to show the money, they need to show the targets, they need to show uh, the locations uh, broken down by local authority uh, areas. And that would mean, in fact, at least half of the annual output uh, of new home construction, including bringing vacants back into use, would be public non-market housing in the first instance led by our local authorities, but with increased output by HBs and community housing trusts. Uh, 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 on affordable housing, PJ is absolutely right. It cannot be conceived as a discount of market. It has to be affordable for the people who live in it. So uh, affordable cost rental is not uh, acceptable at 12 or 1300 euros a month. We need rents comparable to what they have in European mainland uh, cities of seven to 900 euros uh, for standard apartments of one, two and three bedroom units. That is possible if you get the financing of it right, but something unfortunately this government uh, like its predecessors has set its uh, 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 face against. In terms of the private rental sector, we need a secure, stable and affordable private rental sector where tenants have security of tenure and affordable rents and good quality landlords can make a fair return on, on the service they provide. We do not have that at the moment. And therefore, while I absolutely agree with PJ, uh, we do need uh, uh, to link rents uh, to something like the consumer price index. Uh, because rents are so high, we have to stop them uh, rising as an emergency measure. And there a three year ban on rent increases is urgent. Uh, Sinn Féin prefers a refundable tax credit to put a month's rent back in every renter's pocket while we're building up the supply of affordable cost rental. But we also need tenancies of, of indefinite duration, and that is not what this government is proposing. They're proposing to end the six-year rule, but not the Section 34 uh, notice to quit ground, such as vacant possession and used by a family member, and they are the two primary reasons uh, for notices to quit, about 76% of all notices to quit, according to the Residential Tenancies Board in recent figures. Uh, the, the other thing is we have to start talking about the private sector folks. Um, uh, a lot of us, I suppose, who are critics of government have focused on what we want on the public side. But if we are concerned with where the speculative private sector development model is going, and if even under a more progressive housing plan, half of the housing output would be private, then we need to start thinking about better ways of the state activating private sector delivery in ways that uh, ensures those houses have the right standard, uh, both in terms of design and environmental and, and uh, emissions, but also the right price. Uh, and Sinn Féin will be launching a detailed policy document with more information uh, on that in the coming years. But really, it's about ending tax uh, uh, subsidies and, and grant aid and looking at better uses of uh, 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 planning and um, zoning uh, to achieve those ends. And finally, of course, we have to deal with the uh, challenge of climate change. Uh, and it's uh, significant that we're passing a very important piece of legislation in the Rock just this week that will place legally binding targets on all governments and government departments uh, to meet those challenges. That means we need to have a big conversation about planning and how we arrange our, 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 our residential planning to meet that challenge. We have to get infrastructure right, particularly public transport. Uh, 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 and public services, but we also have to move beyond talking about A2 energy rating buildings, even beyond Passive Plus, to looking at how we reduce the embedded carbon in the buildings that we're building uh, uh, and produce new technologies and more uh, uh, environmentally friendly technologies for the homes of the future. What I will say is, is, is housing systems change. Over 30 years ago, we saw a paradigm shift in the wrong direction 
uh, which has led us into 30 years of bad housing policy. I do think we're at a turning point. Rory is right, but we have to be long term. We have to be ambitious uh, and we have to match rhetoric uh, with action and crucially with investment. And I think uh, while I don't expect to be uh, 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 pleasantly surprised by the minister's plan, although I'll always keep an open mind, if this does, government doesn't get it right, if and when there is another general election, housing will dominate like never before. And that will give us an opportunity if this government doesn't get its house in order to ensure that the next government delivers the kind of long-term ambitious and human rights-based housing programme that so many people desperately need. Thanks, Rory. Thanks, Owen. Um, in terms of that presentation there, um, Really, I think, you know, again, highlighting, um, as I did earlier, also, you know, something which, you know, you've can consistently highlighted and is that kind of need for a fundamental shift um, in how we, we treat housing. And I think there is, I suppose, a concern that, um, you know, language, um, and I, I, you refer to it as rhetoric, but a change to language doesn't lead to a change in substance and substantive policy. Um, and I think that is a big concern and that, um, you know, housing systems take time to change as well. That's important, but they need to be changed in a direction. And, and you know, I, I think it's we're all going to be very interested in terms of seeing this new housing plan. Um, unfortunately, time is against us, um, but we do have, I'll, I'll put one, there's a number of questions and, and, and comments in the chat. I'll put one question to, to each of the panelists. Maybe you can respond briefly to it. Um, which is the question of um, traveller accommodation and um, where do we see us actually addressing this issue? Um, and Thomas actually highlights that there's a concern about some house, um, housing associations in terms of, and asks about um, ensuring, how do we ensure members comply with equality legislation and the spirit of the public sector duty? But how do we address um, that issue? I think in particular is one and, um, I think those broader uh, questions of those, those inequalities, entrenched inequalities facing the, the traveling community. If uh, maybe, Owen, do you want to come first? Yeah, sure. So, so the, the, the easy answer is we need the absolute full and speedy implementation of the expert group on traveler accommodation. And the difficulty, of course, is that it is, it is uh, uh, over a year since that report was published, a very good piece of work by the group informed. Uh, and in fact, we're only now getting an implementation group set up. I think they've had one meeting to date. Uh, uh, my concern is, is both the lethargy in the department, uh, uh, the political, um, uh, I suppose, stasis because of COVID, uh, but also some political unwillingness to tackle some of the trickier issues of the Travel Accommodation Group, particularly around planning permissions and land transfers from local authorities, haven't been grasped yet. Um, I do know the, the Traveller Accommodation Implementation Group is meeting again quite shortly. We've asked them for an update on each of the 32 odd recommendations. Uh, it, that report is the solution and it needs to be implemented uh, so that the Traveller Accommodation Plans that are there, many of which are very good, uh, and the finance is broadly there to fund them, are implemented in a speedy fashion. Uh, and that does mean we have to take some tough decisions like taking Part A planning decisions and Section 183 land transfer decisions away from elected members if they're not going to use those powers properly for a temporary period. And also we need the government to keep increasing the travel accommodation budget year on year and making sure that money is spent uh, uh, fully. This is a process that has been going on for four years now since the housing agency and Michelle Norris's review of the travel accommodation programme. It should not have taken this long and we need real urgency. Uh, and I'd like to see Darrell O'Brien as the lead minister drive the implementation of that report. Michelle Norris made this really important point when she presented to us in the committee on this issue in 2019. She said this is one of the most solvable problems in our housing system. The number of households we're talking about is small in number. The land and the finance is there. The travel accommodation programs are there. It is implementation and government can drive that and drive it quickly. And they will have certainly my support and the support of our Optics colleagues in doing that, so long as it's consistent with the expert group's recommendations. Karen, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, thanks. I suppose the traveller pl uh, um, plans, yeah, some may, there have been some developments that have been undertaken by AHBs, and I know the Labrae Park one, for example, in Dublin um, is an AHB involvement there, but it wouldn't be that widespread, I think that's fair to say, um, mainly because we don't have land banks or access to land 
um, it would be local authority lands that uh, would be delivered on in those. And, and also we don't have part eight powers in relation to the planning process. So um, that there are probably some of the reasons why there hasn't been as much involvement. Uh, much of the focus of AHBs is on delivering for the social housing waiting lists. So, you know, it tends to be um, just that, that whatever comes through the waiting list um, is the the sort of the nominations procedures that we we rely on um so i suppose that the land issue is probably a key one there but absolutely be happy to look at how we engage with um the traveler accommodation plans on a, on a local authority wide basis thanks karen and maybe just a last one uh bj if you're there um tina mcveigh has asked that the land development agency as it's currently set out in proposed legislation will only favor even more private and institutional investment in housing, including the new cost rental sector. Um, if we sell off all the public land through the agency, how will we deal effectively with the question of land cost and the housing affordability crisis? PJ there. All right. No, okay, maybe Karen or Owen can come in on that then. Uh, Karen, just, on, to... just on the yeah. cost rental point there, I think the key to uh, long-term affordable cost rental rents is that you have non-profit providers uh, managing the cost rental and delivering it. I think if you hand that over, I think if you hand cost rental over to a profit model, um, then you're going to lose out on the long-term, um, I suppose, affordability elements. Eventually, those rents will revert to a more private market model. So I think that's absolute key point for me in terms of making sure we get the long-term value for the tenant. Okay. Just, just to add, Rory, the, the, yeah. the, the Land Development Agency, as it is currently constituted, is not a good model. Uh, we have uh, approved housing bodies and we have local authorities, and we need to fund them and resource them to do large volumes of mixed income developments uh, with social rental, affordable rental, uh, and affordable leasehold purchase. And one of the things that makes no sense to me is, is if you wanted, for example, the AHB sector to add to their overall output to do more social and more cost rental, uh, you would amend the capital advance loan facility, their primary support from government, so that every AHB development can be a, a social rental and cost rental. Government hasn't done that. Instead, they've created a separate fund, which I think is part of a plan by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in particular, to, to, to constrain the supply of affordable cost rental. I think that's what's going on there. Uh, and likewise, if you look at what's happening in Teresa's Gardens, uh, uh, the Dublin City Council management under pressure from the department are looking at transferring that to the LDA, which means you would get the bizarre situation whereby the local authority will run the social rental, the LDA will run the cost rental, and when the loans on those are paid down, Dublin City Council won't get the benefit of that revenue stream that both uh, PJ and Karen have highlighted. Uh, instead, it will go to this other entity. Uh, and in fact, if the LDA bill goes through in its current form, councillors such as Tina McVeigh, who have a very strong record on this issue, as do our own Myra Devine and others, won't even get to vote on that uh, land transfer uh, because the minister is currently proposing to take that power away from elected members. Uh, and that's particularly about removing the right of elected members to insist that public housing is only used for non-market, or sorry, public land is only used for non-market public housing. So lots and lots of problems with this bill, uh, as well as the affordable housing bill, but we're, we'll work our way through them in the Oireachtas uh, uh, as we go. Great, Owen, thanks. PJ, do you want to come in there, last word? I, I would agree with uh, Owen and Karen, indeed. Uh, the idea that the LDA would be able to um, transfer public housing into private hands is absolutely out of the question, it's outrageous or that they indeed would run uh, cost rental. I think if they were run cost, you know, it would be unfortunate. The state has to run the cost rental scheme. There's no question about that. Could I say a quick word about, because it was mentioned earlier, about disabilities. Uh, housing for mm. disabilities has, uh, the, the neglected citizens of Ireland, they were called in 1996, I think. And I think it was all mentioned it earlier in yourself, that really we need a policy. I have a vested interest here in that I'm chairing a housing, uh, St. John of God's Housing Association, where we try to look after housing for people with disabilities. But there are all sorts of blockages. And I think certainly action is required to improve the lot of people with disabilities. Thanks so much, PJ. And listen, thanks to our panellists, to Karen Murphy, uh, ono Brin and PJ Drudy. It's been a really great uh, session and to, of course to the minister as well for coming along and engaging and um, just encourage our um, participants and 
speakers as well. We are trending on Twitter at the moment on hashtag home uh, human rights. So keep it up and we'll we'll keep the, the messages going and get the, the perspectives and um, uh, I suppose alternatives of what we're trying to progress out there. So, and also a reminder that we do have a screening this evening at seven o'clock of the documentary push and the discussion with the director, which looks at the financialization of housing, a great uh, documentary at seven o'clock. You can check that out. And we're going to a break now. We'll be, we'll be back in just about 10 minutes. So thanks so much. Welcome back to the conference um, today, Home and Human Rights. We're coming back from break for the, the second part of the morning that will take us from now up until lunchtime. Um, my name is Kira Bradley. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Applied Social Studies um, and a colleague of Rory's. And thank you, Rory, for inviting me here today to chair this um, session. So can, a couple of things before we start. Can I just remind everyone um, of the hashtag for today's conference and to continue sharing and uh, on Twitter, um, hashtag home a human right. Um, can I remind everyone also of the, the chat function, which you might like to share your, your thoughts and comments as we go through the morning. And if you have any particular um, questions, if you could add them into the, the question for our speakers. This session is housing as a social determinant of health. And we're very pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Ellen Crushell and Professor Kleena Nikalig, who will join us today um, and deliver two papers, one on the impact of homelessness and uh, inadequate housing on children's health um, and well-being, and one on um, homele uh, homelessness and housing and housing as a social determinant of health. The social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions um, in which people are born, grow, live and age, um, and the wider set of forces and systems that shape the conditions of our daily lives. These forces and systems include economic policies and systems, development agendas, social norms, social policies and political systems. The social determinants of health have important influences on our health inequalities. Um, and significantly contribute to people's well-being, to communities' well-being, um, and to their health overall. And research shows that the social determinants of health um, can be more important even than healthcare or lifestyle choices in influencing health outcomes uh, for individuals and communities. There are numerous studies um, that suggest the social determinants of health uh, account for between 30 to 55 percent of health outcomes. And in addition, these studies estimate that the, the contribution of sectors outside health to population health outcomes exceeds that contribution from the health sector itself. So it's a really important um, area for us to consider here um, and housing and basic communities and the environments that people live in um, are one of these core um, social determinants of health. So I'm going to invite our two speakers. They'll be sharing uh, their papers with us for about 20 minutes each, and we'll follow that with questions. Um, so please do note your questions um, and we'll have plenty of time for discussion at the end. Can I first um, welcome um, Dr. Ellen Crushell, who is the, the clinical lead within the HSE and the Royal Co College of uh, Physicians, the National Clinical Programme for Children, and also an associate clinical professor in UCD. Um, and Helen's paper this morning will be on the impact of homelessness and in, inadequate housing on children's health and well-being. So thank you, uh, Dr. Crushell, for, for joining us this morning and over to you. Um, thanks very much, Kira. Oh, I think you're thanks. on mute, Helen. Helen. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I'll just share my screen and get the slides up. Does that uh, project okay? No, it's not up yet. You're not seeing it? Okay, one sec. 
Oops. Mm, not sure what why. Okay. Okay, you can see that. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Great. So my name is Ellen Crushell. Um, thank you very much to Rory and the organisers for inviting me to speak about the impact of homelessness and inadequate housing on children's health and well-being. Just want to start with a question from uh, one of the papers we were involved with um, from the College of Physicians. Each child has but one childhood and it passes all too quickly. So we need to bear that in mind. I know just a quick overview of my talk and um, I'll, I'll run over a couple of definitions um, and then I'll concentrate on the impact of, of being homeless on children's health and well-being and I'll refer to this paper from the College of Physicians throughout. I'll also cover access to health services and touch on the impact of the pandemic on this particular group. So how do we define family homelessness? Well, family homelessness is where you have a parent or two parents. Most uh, homeless families are parented by one parent, where there's one or more dependent children who have presented to a local authority as homeless and have been confirmed by the local authority to be so. They're then usually placed in temporary emergency accommodation, which takes the form of hotel rooms, B&Bs or family hubs. Hidden homelessness, however, is a broader concept. It also includes those who are staying with family and friends, uh, such as couch surfing, um, and those that live in inadequate, overcrowded housing, such as mobile homes. And overcrowding has been defined in the Housing Act of 1966, and it's based on the size of number of bedrooms per adult and child. There are a few key points to remember in the Irish context. One in 11 of our children, or 9%, live in consistent poverty. Children have the highest risk of poverty over any other age group. There are approximately uh, 2,500 homeless children and, and another 2,000 in the international protection application system. So they're living in direct provision or in emergency accommodation when direct provision is at capacity. There are thousands more living in hidden homelessness and inadequate housing. We must remember that homeless numbers are taken at a point in time. They're fluid, families come in and out of homelessness. So we're talking about multiples of these numbers of children will experience a period of homelessness during their childhood. And another factor to bear in mind that groups that are more medically vulnerable are overrepresented in the homeless population. I'm thinking in particular of um, the traveler population and the Roma population who already have a significant uh, burden of childhood illness, even when stably housed. This is Temple Street Hospital where I work. Um, it's an old children's hospital in the inner city. The catchment area is very deprived with many, many emergency accommodation facilities and family hubs nearby. Over the last number of years at Temple Street, we've noticed increasing numbers of homeless children of 53,000 emergency department attendances in 2018, 842 did not have a permanent address. Homeless and deprived children are overrepresented in the way to go obesity service. And the management of chronic disease in children can be very challenging due to their accommodation. For example, I was involved with the care of a, one family who had five children, two of whom have a rare metabolic disorder, which needs very, very specific um, uh, dietary treatment. And trying to provide this in a hotel setting um, is almost impossible. We've also had increasing numbers of migrant children who've been inadequately treated prior to their arrival in Ireland. Um, I can think of an example of a Syrian children, a, ch a Syrian child who had PKU, and this is a, a treatable disorder if it's treated early. So he had been diagnosed in Syria, but there was no treatment available either there or in the refugee camps along his route. So by the time he arrived to Ireland, he had significant uh, permanent developmental delay and his dietetic management while the direct provision center was it was completely supportive. It was very challenging. It all it, it did improve, however, when the family were housed in their own housing with their own catering facilities. So, what are the health implications of um, of, of of for these children? Well, let's start at the beginning. Babies that are born into homelessness are already at a disadvantage from before their birth. Their mothers often have inadequate antenatal care. There is an increased risk of maternal, fetal, and neonatal complications. These babies are more likely to have been exposed to substances like alcohol and tobacco in utero and infections such as HIV or hepatitis. 
and these these infections and substances um, can have long term um, impacts on their their health and development. Uh, babies of homeless mothers are more likely to be born prematurely and to be of low birth weight. Low birth weight is a weight of 2.5 kilos or less, and that's five, five pounds. Um, low birth weight in its own right is associated with poor long-term health and educational outcomes for children, and it's also unfortunately associated with maternal depression. These babies are less likely to be breastfed, so they miss out on the, the added benefits of breastfeeding. As we're all too aware in the current climate, um, overcrowding spreads infections. Classically, we think of the association that's long established between with t overcrowding and TB and meningitis. There was a prolonged uh, meningitis outbreak in, a, in an extended traveler community for, that lasted three years and that was described to be due to overcrowded accommodation. Homeless children get more colds and ear infections. They're more prone to skin infestations. These pictures show a scabies mite, which burrows under the skin, and that's a close-up of the skin. You get an inflammation, a very itchy rash uh, in the skin, and it can look like this in a young child. Um, so that's one of the infestations that can occur. They can get super infected and end up being hospitalized. And eradicating scabies from, from a family home, it can be very difficult. Homeless adolescents are at increased risk of sexually transmitted infections. So Swedish study demonstrated that if, if a child lives in a home with three signs of dampness, they are three times more likely to suffer recurrent wheezing episodes, and this can persist, persist right into adulthood. Chronic cough and frequent colds are also, also more frequently seen. Homeless toddlers are more likely to have developmental delay at 18 months. An American study found that 75% of homeless children aged less than five will have one major delay, and this, the, the domain most commonly affected was speech. 44% will have delay in, in, a, in a second domain also. Um, similar uh, research has come from Limerick, illustrating the same in Ireland. The delay is worse than in stably housed children of similar incomes. And the, while there are probably multiple factors involved, um, but the factors in, include probably limited opportunity to explore and learn and parental stress. The developmental delay may go unnoticed um, in these families. And when it is picked up, they often face long waiting lists for services. Health literacy and limited catering facilities are two key factors impacting on homeless children's nutrition. Obesity is the commonest nutritional problem that's seen. Their diets are more likely to consist of nutritionally poor but calorie dense foods. These foods um, can paradoxically cause micronutrient and vitamin deficiencies, even in the context of a child being overweight. Dental caries is, is also common and dental neglect in, in this population. This child uh, has milk bottle caries from sleeping with a bottle at night, and the only treatment for those uh, teeth at the front is extractions. Being homeless is, is not safe for children. <clears throat> Poor accommodation presents more hazards, and house fires are more common. Burns and toddler skulls in particular can happen in overcrowded housing and have been associated, for example, with hotel rooms or direct provision settings where there may be a kettle in the corner of the bedroom. And this, uh, this child ha it has a classic pull down scald. It's a toddler who's pulled hot water out of himself. Homeless children and children in direct provision are significantly more likely to be referred to TUSLA with concerns about child abuse and neglect. They're also exposed to many unrelated adults and may witness substance abuse and violence. 38% of homeless children have a mental health or behavioral disorder of clinical significance. Behavioral disorders in particular often reflect family stress. Um, unsurprisingly, families report negative changes in their child's behavior upon moving into emergency accommodation. And being in temporary accommodation for more than a year will triple the risk of a mental health problem, in particular anxiety and depression. And the risk appears to increase with, with, the, with increased numbers of moves. The impact unfortunately continues after children are housed with two thirds of them still having ongoing problems a year later. Adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are traumatic events that occur during childhood. Example of ACEs include um, the loss of a parent, divorce, abuse, neglect. Um, homelessness is a significant ACE. Having four or more ACEs is significantly associated with poor physical and mental health outcomes. 
This pyramid illustrates the mechanism through which ACEs lead to disrupted neurodevelopment of children, um, to impairment of their social, emotional, cognitive development, adopting health risky behaviors, uh, which then increases the, the risks for disease, disability, social problems, and early death. Having eight ACEs is likely to shorten your life by 20 years. So adverse uh, childhood experiences impact on so many aspects of an adult's life. And here are some examples. Adults who have ACEs are more likely to have a traumatic brain injury or other injuries. They have a higher incidence of mental health problems, maternal and fetal problems, infections, including HIV and sexually transmitted diseases. The health implications are huge. They're more likely to develop cancer, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and lung disease. They are more likely to engage in risky behaviors, including alcohol and drug abuse and unsafe sex. It's all the adver early adversity is also associated with the loss of opportunities in education, occupation, and future relationships. Being homeless or marginalized um, affects children's social and educational development. They lack space and facilities to play. They can't invite friends over, and they're often excluded by their peers. They have lower academic uh, achievements that can't be explained by differences in level of, of ability. Challenging behaviors such as impulsivity, aggression, hyperactivity can compromise their not just their academic achievements, but also their relationships with their peers and their teachers. Irish primary school principals report that children in homeless accommodation are more likely to have low self-esteem, exhaustion and isolation. Parenting while homeless is extremely difficult. A secure attachment is essential for babies to thrive. The primary relationship is essential to developing emotional regulation and empathy and laying down the foundation for future relationships. Parental stress or mental health difficulties can impede this relationship and the ability to parent effectively. And this can, is all compounded where there's family conflict, drug and alcohol abuse. However, we do know that when the relationship is supportive, parents can actually act as a buffer against the negative effects of instability in their children's lives. It has been shown that parents in overcrowded homes are less responsive to their, ch their children's needs compared to families in non-crowded but similar income housing. Rules that are set um, in shelters and direct provision can also undermine parents' self-respect, especially if they can't set and maintain rules themselves for their own children and if they have to parent in public. Homeless families are less likely to avail of preventive health and primary care. The children have double the risk of emergency hospitalization. They often, as we see in Temple Street, use the emergency department for primary care needs. They may miss their routine vaccinations. Their lives can be stressful and chaotic, so they mean they miss health appointments. And similarly, unfortunately, our health system is not well set up at all to accommodate mobile or marginalized families. Education and health literacy are both major factors in these families' ability to navigate our health system. So we can improve access for marginalized groups through inclusion health approaches. There are already established adult inclusion health teams at St. James's and the Mater, and we're setting on a new collaborative initiative for pediatrics. Um, Children's Health Ireland, the College of Physicians, the HSE, and the St. James's team have all been involved. We're fortunate to secure funding for a fellowship in inclusion pediatrics starting in July, and funding has also been secured to support research from the Irish perspective um, to scope out a pediatric inclusion model and service. The Lynn Clinic is a good example. Um, it was recently set up in October of last year. It's a clinic, a general pediatric clinic for marginalized children. It's called after Dr. Kathleen Lynn, one of Ireland's uh, earliest pediatricians, and it aims to address some of the barriers to accessing care. It has a direct referral and rapid onset, uh, a, a direct referral and rapid access system. It's located in a, in a primary care center nearby to Temple Street, and it's staffed by a Temple Street consultant and registrars. The attendance is supported um, at the clinic, and I think this is a key point through taxis and temperatures, multiple phone calls, and the public health nurses. Public health nurses, in fact, and TUSLA are also invited to the appointments if the families agree. 
In complex cases, the hospital day unit with the full team are, um, is, is used. This avoids the need for multiple appointments. And so far, there's been full cooperation from uh, Temple Street and their staff. So, um, so how does the clinic look? Well, 75% of the children are in homeless accommodation. There are multiple ethnicities and nationalities there. 27% are Roma and 12% are Irish traveller. The majority also have coexisting as uh, complex social needs with 37% 30 already having social work and to, or to slow involvement. Um, if a child fails to attend the appointment, they're given a, a slot at the very next clinic. And interestingly, only 5% fail to attend that. This figure is, is far is much lower than the usual failure to attend rates in all other hospital outpatient um, clinics. A wide variety of medical complexity has been seen and 70% of them in fact uh, need some form of hospital follow-up. Um, almost 60% have incomplete or no vaccinations and 42% had, had been using the children's emergency department as the main source of primary care. So how does it work in practice? Well, here are two case studies. Uh, the first is a six-year-old girl who's known to have kidney disease. Um, she's from the traveler community and she's had multiple failed attendances over three years. Mom, uh, mom herself has significant health and mobility issues. So she, uh, the child and, and parent were picked up by taxi, brought to radiology at the hospital for an ultrasound and then onto the clinic uh, where she had her investigations done. A direct, uh, direct contact was made with the renal team in the hospital to confirm a follow-up plan and mum was informed of that there and then, which allowed her to easily link back into the hospital services, um, which, which, has, which has happened successfully. Another case is a three-year-old Roma boy who had difficulty walking and his neurological examination was abnormal. So he needed to be assessed by multiple health care professionals that would normally uh, require multiple different appointments, each of them needing quite a degree of coordination. So instead, he was booked into the day unit at the hospital uh, with an interpreter for the full day. And he was seen that day by the neurologist, physio, dietitian, social worker, and had multiple investigations, including imaging that were needed. So there is ongoing liaison now uh, between the family and the public health nurse and community services who are all kept in the loop and he has attended all subsequent hospital appointments. So I want to touch on the impact of the pandemic. The, the, the impact has been felt by all children, of course, as we all know, but most by those um, who are already at a disadvantage. All waiting lists across the health system will have increased. Um, community services were stalled and children missed essential public health nurse visits, developmental assessment and other routine services. We tend to overlook how much of routine child health services are delivered quite effectively through the schools. So vaccines, dental, vision, hearing, checks, etc., were all suspended. So there's a lot to catch up on. Families have felt the lack of social supports, such as the extended family who will help out with child, child raising and child minding, and the lack of access to support workers. Disadvantaged families and, and those who have children with disabilities have been, have been affected most acutely. Children have had less access to supportive adults outside the immediate family and has been widely publicized um, how alcohol intake and child reported domestic violence have increased during the pandemic. The policing authority are also concerned about um, the almost universal increased time spent online by children. We have um, a mental health uh, crisis in our country. Um, CAMS and psychology services were already stretched before the pandemic. But in the last year, we've seen a 41% increase in crisis presentations uh, to the emergency departments, and that's in the context of a reduced attendance overall. There's been a 65% increase in admissions of children with eating disorders. And a subject close to our hearts is the school closures. They have disproportionately affected homeless and marginalized groups due to the digital divide, lack of access to quiet space and parental inability to support homeschooling due to language and other barriers. We worry that the educational gap will have significantly widened. We know that uh, from Irish and UK studies, the disadvantaged children at the age of 16 were already behind uh, 18 months behind their wealthier peers. A rise in early school leaving is expected, and this has already been seen in France and California. 
The long-term effects, economic effects, will be most felt by the disadvantaged children. The OECD estimate from the 2020 closures that, th that all children can expect a 3% loss in lifelong earnings. Food insecurity has been exacerbated due to closure of breakfast clubs and school meals. School is a safe haven for many children who have difficult home situations, and 25% of Tusla referrals are via the schools, which act as a, as a, a safety net. Children in direct provision report feeling most included in our society while they're excluded. Well, sorry, feeling most included in our society while they're at school. Parents also report concerns about the lack of sense of occupation the children have due to school closures and the lack of socialization. So what can be done? Uh, well, the good news is uh, that for every $1 that's invested in early childhood, you reach, reap $8 back. That's according to US studies. Um, we should be able to better prevent and minimize childhood adversity through parenting and family supports and inclusion programs to bring these marginalized families closer into our society. society. We need to embed inclusion health, inclusion health models of care. And last, but most importantly, we need to avoid any further school closures, particularly for these groups. Thank you very much. I'd just like to acknowledge um, my colleagues in the program, John Murphy and Jackie DeLacy, public health colleagues, Ingrid Shelley, Julie Heslin and Margaret Fitzgerald, who led on, the, uh, on this paper. Um, Neve O'Brien, Henri Hayes, Avian Walsh, our trainees, pediatric trainees who have all been uh, very involved in this area. Uh, Siobhan Neville, Connor Hensey, Brigitte Joyce, and Elizabeth Barrett, and of course the, the teams in the, in the College of Physicians and Prof Horgan in particular, and Kleena uh, Nikalik, who's speaking next, and Unigiri St. James's, who've paved the way. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ellen. Um, thank you for such a comprehensive overview and for taking us through you know, the practical implications for children and young people of poor housing and homelessness. Uh, for identifying some of the challenges in the health service and, and also illuminating how the innovative approaches that you've been taking with your group have actually made a practical um, and tangible impact on, on families um, as well. And then finally, summarizing some of the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic have impacted on children and particularly um, on children who are living in, in poor accommodation um, and in, in homelessness. Thank you very much. Um, for everyone in the, in the audience, please keep continue to add your questions. Um, uh, we are noting all of the questions and we'll have some time at the end to respond to some of the questions. And just a reminder as well that all of these talks are being recorded and um, they'll be available on the Reboot Republic podcast on the Musi um, Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute website. Um, and a reminder as well at this point, just to, to keep tweeting um, and, you know, get this issue out um, into, into the world uh, via Twitter uh, while you're here. So thank you. I'd like to invite um, now Dr. Klina Nikalik, um, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Clinical Medicine in Trinity College Dublin, consultant physician, um, also involved in the Inclusion Health Service and in St. James's Hospital. So thank you, um, Kleena, for joining us today. Um, and we really welcome your presentation on homelessness and inadequate housing as a social determinant of health. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Kira and to Rory for inviting me. It's a real a privilege. And I've learned loads this morning. I think this has one of, been one of the best conferences I've been at in the last few years. And um, so I suppose to just start with, can I, how do I share my screen? Do you know? Yeah, so if you... Oh, sorry, it was just I had it minimized. OK, great. Um, good. So first of all, um, it's it's brilliant that uh, you've invited myself and Ellen, uh, not only because we're enjoying the conference, but I think highlighting the interface between housing and health. Um, and as a doctor, it's not really something that I was taught about during my years in college. I learned lots about molecules and, and surgery and anatomy and pathways. And it wasn't until I started working as a as a doctor in James's that I really started to see the huge effect that social determinants of health have on people's health and on my work as a hospital doctor. Um, and I became more and more interested in, in trying to understand and address those. And I, I, I would love to see all our medical students getting some of the talks that we've had earlier today because uh, housing and health are inextricably linked. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, explain what we do, why we do it, um, and then we'll hopefully have plenty of time for questions. 
So first of all, and Ellen has, has already alluded to this, poverty is bad for you. Um, and we know this not only in terms of countries in which uh, poor countries in which people, you know, are literally starving for, for want of nutrition or are exposed to the weather. Um, but even in rich countries, there's a gradient across um, across wealth in a society that affects people's health. Um, and one of the hardest endpoints, so we always talk about what endpoints do we measure in health, but one of the hardest endpoints, the strongest endpoints is death. You're either alive or you're dead. It's very binary. Um, and one way to look at it, that is the standardized mortality ratio. And that is your likelihood of dying within the next year at any given age. So if you're 20, you're very unlikely to die within the next year. If you're 100, you're quite likely to die within the next year of life. But no matter wh where you look, which uh, rich country you look at, you're twice as likely at any given age to die in the next year if you live in a poor area um, than if you live in a rich uh, area. So if you live in Donnybrook, you're half as likely to die um, as a hundred year old as if you live in Ballymun. Um, and about at least two thirds of this is unexplained scientifically. So when I talk to my medical students about this, they would say, well, there are differences in smoking, there are differences in the type of food people eat. Uh, they use a term that I hate, which is uh, lifestyle choices, because I, I think we, we oversimplify uh, that, that concept. But actually, if you, even if you correct for all of those known behavioral variables, um, only about a third of that difference gets corrected out. So there's something about poverty and its effect on health that we don't understand. And that's known as the slope index of inequality. Michael Marmot has written loads on it. There's loads that you can read. It's really interesting. But what Ellen and I have been talking about and what you're talking about in this conference, once you talk about people who are homeless, are people who are socially excluded. And there's a number of ways to define this, but I think we all recognize it when we see it. And one of the important movements in health over the last uh, decade has been recognizing that homelessness is part of a constellation of experiences that tend to run together. And Ellen alluded uh, to this. So people who are homeless frequently will also have issues with addiction, may have been in the um, in prison um, may have exchanged sex for money or drugs, that these are all facets of a common experience of being socially excluded in society. And social exclusion groups that aren't in this seminal paper, but that would have very similar characteristics would be people from the traveling community, people who are Roma, if you look in Australia, Aboriginal community, if you look in Canada, First Nation, it's this common life experience that certain people in our society are exposed to. And if you look at the effect of that social exclusion on people's health, Michael Marmot calls it poverty on stilts. So it's like poverty, but somebody turned the volume on the speaker all the way up. Um, and what you see is that standardized mortality ratio, that chance of dying in the next year is 12 fold higher if you're a woman living in social exclusion and eight fold higher if you're, if you're a man living in social exclusion. And this is interesting in many ways. Firstly, it's incredibly stark. And if we look at the average age of death of single homeless women in Dublin, it's 38. Out of single homeless men is 44. And um, so those are levels uh, even lower by age of death than we would see in countries um, like the Democratic Republic of Congo or Central African Republic that have very, very uh, high mortality rates. It's also interesting to see that it affects women more than men and the consistent threat the work on social exclusion and again from a feminist perspective from a societal perspective it's important to recognize that things like a uh, lack of appropriate housing disproportionately affect women they affect men hugely and they affect women even more so so you can think that we have this slope of poverty being bad for your health but social exclusion and um, which is very much typified by homelessness is incredibly bad for your health and that happens in basically any disease that you can think of. So you're more likely to have a psychiatric disease if you're homeless, you're more likely to have addiction, but you're also more likely to have cancer, cardiovascular disease. Um, Ellen has alluded to childhood diseases like kidney disease. So all diseases are more common essentially uh, in people who are living in social exclusion. And similar, we've seen with the COVID pandemic, higher risk of being exposed to COVID. And also when you get it, much higher risk of becoming severely unwell and requiring ICU support or dying from COVID. One of the things that drive healthcare utilization in a modern, um, semi-modern healthcare system like we have in Ireland is aging. So the majority of inpatients that we look after in hospital that we're trying to manage with the bed demand and all the other things that we try to juggle are there because they're older, they're multi-morbid, so they have several chronic diseases and they're frail, which is really your body just kind of losing its reserves, losing its strength so that it can't cope with challenges. And we looked at this 
in people of high SES, low SES and homeless people. And you can see again, there's a gradient. Uh, if you're poorer, you're more likely to age earlier, more likely to become frail earlier. There's about a five year shift in that. But in homelessness, we see a 20, 30, 40 year shift. And this very much correlates with what we're seeing on the ground. People in their 40s and 50s who are homeless coming in with osteoporosis, dementia, very severe COPD, all the diseases that we associate with aging, um, but we're seeing them at a much earlier age. Um, and that's the multimorbidity that I've alluded to. How does that affect a very overstretched health system? And how does that affect people's need to use something that we have a shortage of, which is acute uh, beds for acute and scheduled care? And it has a huge impact. So this is work from 2015, uh, looking at the number of ED attendances and bed days in an acute hospital per annum in housed versus homeless people living in the catchment area of James's. And you can see that there's a huge increase, an over tenfold increase in the need for these services, which are very, very stretched already. And I think we've really seen that as a hospital based in inner city Dublin. We've seen that as the homelessness crisis has really got out of control over the last 10 years, it has directly impacted on our ED, on our acute beds, because it's making people sick, it's making them require um, unscheduled care and, and they're needing to come in. And that's obviously very challenging in a setting which already um, is overstretched and, and in which there are many gaps in moving people on from acute care. So I'd like now to talk, unpick a little bit to see if we can understand a little bit more about what, what is homelessness doing to people that is causing them to become sick, that is affecting their health. Um, and I think the first thing to highlight is this is not a new phenomenon. So I love a bit of history. Um, Dublin was the poorest capital city in the Commonwealth throughout the 1800s, including before the famine, uh, and child mortality rates in Dublin were higher than in Calcutta, so this is not a new problem. And I was lucky enough to see a fantastic adaptation of a play written by Sean O'Casey called Nana's Last Night, um, and it was talking about a, a homeless lady who had an alcohol uh, addiction, and it talked about the prisons, the mortuaries, uh, sorry, the prisons, the workhouse and the grave, those are their palaces, talking about people living in poverty in inner city Dublin. And what do we see today? We still see prisons, we still see uh, the grave, we see a lot of early mortality, and James's used to be a workhouse. So, so things haven't changed. This is a long-standing um, connection between inadequate housing, poverty, social exclusion and health. And I think how I probably conceptualized it when I started and how, you know, maybe we're taught to think about in medical school is that there's these kind of random events that happen and they randomly happen to people um, and we don't look at the bigger social context and what's driving it. But Ellen has already alluded to this. There's a very strong cycle of adversity, which society and political decisions and decisions around housing supply and all of those things, education, childhood, mental health, uh, prison, all of those things. They can either trap people in the cycle or they can help them to break out. But what we see very clearly in the socially excluded people, the homeless people that we work with, is their adversity has usually started in utero with their mother being uh, challenged in various ways. And, you know, they may have been born at a smaller size. They may have been born earlier. Early childhood uh, characterized again by difficulties which are hugely compounded for families living in hostel or homeless accommodation, as Ellen has alluded to. And I think if there's one thing I would wish to change tomorrow, it would be that it's it's just just unbearable to think about. And then we have issues with schools, with school exclusion, with experiences in school, early adulthood being characterized um, by interaction with the criminal justice system, parenthood sometimes being characterized by losing children into state care or otherwise having difficulties parenting, and then premature aging and death. And then of course, losing a parent at a relatively young age. So when we see homeless people dying in their thirties and forties, they frequently have children who are losing a parent at a young age. And that then compounds um, the adversity and passes us on to the next generation. And this is hugely costly. So if there's one thing I would uh, love to see will be a way of when we measure the cost of things, when we measure the cost of health interventions, uh, when we measure the cost of housing policies, I think we really need to look at it from a life cycle perspective and look at the costs that accrue over the lifetime, for example, of a child who's being brought up um, in homeless accommodation. And that spans things like, you know, their education, their mental health needs. Do they go to prison? Do their children go into state care? And I think if we look at the financial impact or the state cost to the state, for example, of our current housing crisis, um, I think it would be very clear what the rational and money saving approach is. 
And I think the final um, thing, uh, a final thing that I'd like to say about homelessness before we move on to further topics is it's a real form of structural violence. So structural violence um, is a context concept that was introduced in medicine by Paul Farmer, who works in global health, but it's around preventable suffering that society exerts on people. And, and people living in homelessness, families living in homelessness, they experience suffering. So they can't have their friends over, they're all crammed into a small room, they can't cook, they're embarrassed, they're moved around. All of those things are preventable suffering. Um, and I think we need to recognize that, that homelessness is a form of structural violence and definitely is an adverse childhood experience, which has the lifetime consequences that Ellen has spoken about. So how does housing affect or inadequate housing, or for example, here's a, a very, an example of where most of my patients uh, until the COVID pandemic lived in these dormitory style and um, very transient homeless hostels in which they were placed in a different night. How does that affect people's health? And it affected in some very concrete practical ways like exposure to viruses like COVID or tuberculosis, uh, like falling out of a top bunk and fracturing your leg, like not having access to good nutrition because um, you know, you're, you're relying on catered meals that are brought in from elsewhere, um, like not getting your appointments um, for your, I don't know, your colonoscopy or your asthma clinic because you're in a different address. All of those things have a very direct and practical impact on people's health, but they also affect um, through our social biology. And in humans, it's very tempting to, to attribute the, the effects of social determinants of health to things like smoking, alcohol, drug use, exercise. But if you look in animal models in which you can exclude those things, you can see that your perception, animals' perception in this case of mon monkeys of stigma or of being kind of out of the pack have a very profound effect on the immune system and through that directly affect their health. Um, and they, they affect their behavior as well. So this is in mice um, and the mouse who is excluded from the group um, has a leaky blood brain barrier and it displays changes in behavior. So what we're doing in terms of putting people into homelessness um, is having very direct consequences on their biology. Um, and in particularly, it affects their ability to fight off viruses. So I think with COVID, this is, has become increasingly important. Addiction, um, I think, is, is a really important thing to think about in the setting of homelessness. The, the narrative in society is often that people get an addiction first and then become homeless as a result of their addiction. Data would show that it's frequently the other way around, that some, a young person becomes homeless either as leaving state care and going into homelessness, uh, falling out with their family um, for various reasons. And then after they become homeless, they then become addicted uh, to, to heavier drugs like heroin and crack cocaine that have very severe consequences on people's health. Um, and so addiction affects their health directly, um, but it also affects it in, in how we perceive them in society. Um, so there's a lot of stigma, both stigma internalized by the person and stigma that we exert as, as people looking after those people or people in contact uh, with those people around addiction. Um, and that can result in terms of healthcare and behaviors, that shame and stigma, um, people often will react to that with anger, or what we perceive as challenging behavior, and that can further disenfranchise them from healthcare. I think this is a really important concept, and it's interesting, again, in the narrative around housing, who deserves housing, who doesn't. Uh, children deserve housing, absolutely. It's much easier to see that all children deserve something. Um, but in society, we, we do measure up who deserves what, and our political and social choices are as a consequence of that, and that's very strong as well in, in the health system. You can see, for example, in our state underfunding of the mental health uh, services and, and children and adult mental health services that we perceive people who need those services on some level as less deserving than other services which are better funded, for example, our cancer services. Inclusion health, as Ellen has alluded to, is an approach um, which basically puts the onus back on the people who work in the health system to address these profound inequalities. And it's not just one thing, it's, it's really a, a multiple, multi-angle integrated approach that really starts with what the person needs and goes from there and, and recognizes that our you know, physical need like clean, dry socks, for example, our psychological needs like feeling accepted and safe, all of those have a big impact on our health and how we interact with the health system. And what we've shown is that if you can meet people's needs in a more appropriate way, they don't need to use as much uh, acute unscheduled hospital care because they're healthier. And um, so again, showing that investing in the right thing often also yields financial benefits. I think 
what I absolutely would like to highlight today, and it's so that's why I'm so delighted to be on this conference, is all of the work that we want to do in terms of people's um, health. And I'm particularly thinking we have a lot of homeless people with chronic disease or with severe psychiatric disease or with severe disabilities, uh, care leavers, all of the psychological and healthcare work that they need. Uh, really, the foundation for that is providing them with appropriate housing. Um, and I think sometimes it can be frustrating um, to, you know, people who are homeless absolutely need a huge amount of health support and appropriate health support. But in equal parallel, they need access to housing. And with our current housing shortage, no matter what way we reallocate the housing or what way we try to prioritize people, there is such a dramatic shortage of it that the people who desperately need housing for their health um, cannot access it because there simply isn't enough housing to go around. Um, and it is always the same vulnerable people, people with chronic disease, people with me mental health issues, um, people who've been disadvantaged since birth, people with disabilities, they are always the people who, will, who, are, who are more likely to fall out of housing. Um, so those who need housing the most are the ones who in a housing shortage are the least likely to get it. And then that compounds their health difficulties. So I'm really happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lena, for, for that uh, presentation. I'm really struck by how you started by making the connections between housing and health, and you really took us through the evidence of how housing is a social determinant of health. Um, but also making the connections between housing and the health service and the impacts on the health service and um, how um, the emergency department becomes a necessary primary site, um, a primary care site for people who are um, living in homelessness. Absolutely. And Kira, what we also see a lot of is people going into long term care like nursing homes and, um, you know, particularly those with disabilities when there isn't housing and appropriate community supports. And all of those are very, very costly solutions to a housing issue. Yeah. Absolutely. As a social scientist, I'm really interested in, you know, the structural violence. And I think you illuminated that very, very well and really put the onus back on us as, as those of us who are part of systems that, that can either perpetuate inequalities or work to, um, to tackle inequalities. And um, again, giving us really good insight into how inclusion health um, works to do that. And, and I think that's where we need to focus our, our energies and efforts in how we can be transformative. Um, I was also really struck by the, the point you made about um, how all of these uh, inequalities can affect our ability to fight viruses, that very like physical reaction to the inequalities that we experience. And I think that's kind of a new perspective for many of us here. Um, and, and also the connections you're making um, in terms of stereotypes and addiction. I, I think all, all of those points are, are so important. So we'll open the floor now to the audience for um, for questions and invite people to add their questions, please, into the to the Q and A um, for our two our two speakers. Um, we have a couple of questions already, uh, and and I'll start uh, by by posing one of them. So, the 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 participant is wondering whether Cleaner's observations apply to all homeless groups or mainly groups that are experiencing chronic homelessness. So, is there a difference between the experience of homelessness and the um, health outcomes and, and those experiences? So, I mean, there's definitely a, a, as a medic, I'm going to say a dose response curve. So the longer you're homeless, the worse it affects you. Um, I was at a really great meeting recently with some people from the Department of Health, and I was so encouraged. I think they really got have got this concept. Um, but we, one of the participants who's an amazing GP who works in Cork called Anna Maria Nocton was talking about this golden hour. So when you have people, for example, leaving care or leaving prison or, you know, discharged from hospital and they can't return home or whatever reason they become homeless, you really have a short period of time where you need to get them out. And by the end of one or two months, people's social networks, their coping strategies, all of that will change um, and it can be much harder. So, yeah, I mean, does being homeless for a week affect your health to a much lesser degree? Than being chronically homeless and um, but yeah so it really emphasizes the importance of a swift response and and which is dependent on housing availability yeah thank you very much we have another question um that's come in and i think this one for for dr crucial uh, do you think a trauma-informed approach is important at local authority local authority level who might be the first point of contact for people experiencing homelessness 
I think that would be very useful. Um, and I, I'm afraid I don't know what whether that exists at the moment, but I do know for sure that, that the homeless organizations such as Focus are very, very acutely aware of, of, uh, of the trauma that children are undergoing and try and support families with family support workers and all of that in as much as they can. And, and um, so that that's good. And I think lots more of that certainly will help reduce the adversity. Obviously, you'd rather avoid the adversity at all in the first place, but whatever you can do to kind of boost the, the family structure, boost the relationships, help reduce the stress within the family, I think can only have added benefits to everybody in, in, in the family, particularly the children. Yeah. I think that's a really useful lens, isn't it, as a, a policy response. So thinking about like interagency collaboration, like the joined up thinking across the different services, particularly those on the front line. Um, and maybe, you know, taking that kind of lens of, of um, immediate intervention or, and thinking also about family connections and support networks as a core kind of part of whatever the, the, the policy intervention might be. Um, thank you. We have another question coming in from a, a community worker who has worked for many years um and also and listening to to the hse's response that housing has has nothing to do with addiction or what the response that what how what has housing to do got to do with addiction um what might be either of your responses to that so i suppose my experience of addiction is it's people's way of coping with in otherwise intolerable emotions and sensations um, and homelessness is can be very intolerable for a lot of people. I would find it really hard to share a dormitory room with eight people that I don't know every night and to not have anywhere that I felt safe um, or I could have privacy and to be out during the day trying to fill my days. So, so I think, you know, a lack of appropriate housing definitely increases people's need to use substances to, to, to manage. Um, and then, of course, addiction is often a pathway as well into homelessness. So people with addiction are, you know, they're not as attracted to the hat landlord um, as somebody who doesn't have an addiction. So they tend to be more likely to to fall into homelessness. So it's a two way thing that really then just tends to to cycle. So maybe we've in response to that question, we've we've worked to do in terms of our shared understanding of these connections uh, at a policy level and, and at a service level. Um, in terms of how we're supporting, maybe not every agency or organization has the same kind of understanding of um, the connections between housing and addiction and, and housing as a social determinant of health that has, you know, a, a massive impact on people's ability to cope. So, for example, women who are trying to, to leave their home because of domestic violence and um, the vast majority of domestic violence services won't take women who have uh, addiction. So, you know, that's a real example of that, of addiction being a, a barrier to, to exiting homelessness. In your experience, Kleena um, and, and Ellen, is it hard to, to kind of shift public uh, or policy perception on, on this um, issue and this the, the connections between, like, are you, the evidence you presented this morning, is that widely accepted it or is it in some way contested? So I think it's been really well accepted. Um, and I think that's for a number of reasons. So I worked for a short period of time in the UK and I was really struck by on some level in Ireland, there is a concept of, you know, we were all poor a relatively short time ago and there is a concept of a social contract and you know looking after those who have less so that's one good thing um, and I think it's so clear to see I mean you can physically see it when you walk down the street and see somebody who's homeless they look sick and um, so the Department of Health have come out endorsing inclusion health as their strategy and um, we've been funded our team in the matter and they're they're hopefully going to fund a pediatric service so I think they can see the, the return in terms of cost I think maybe where we've had less impact is in the housing sector. Yeah, I agree with Kleena. I think it's, you know, the evidence when presented to our colleagues, for example, and it's, it isn't something that's taught. Um, so I'll be offering this lecture to, to the colleges if they're interested, but, um, I, and, and I think that's a crucial point. We pick it up on the job where you realize the stark reality of it on the job. And, and it's, 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 so it would be accepted amongst our college, but we don't really have a great culture of, for example, social pediatrics in Ireland. Um, pediatrics is very much a hospital specialty. So 
trying to break down those barriers between the hospitals and community, I think is, is where we need to go and, and taking the responsibility to look after these families properly rather than letting them to their devices, which, which, which sometimes fails. I think that's a really interesting point, um, Ellen. So it's something that's not taught that you pick up while working mm -hmm. in the sector. Um, do you think that possibly indicates, you know, that that it's not fully embraced as a, as a viewpoint, you know, if it's not part of the curriculum for, for doctors? I think it's more the medical model. You think of the heart disease, you think of, and you know that, that you know, poverty is a risk factor for heart disease, but you're taught about the heart disease rather than the poverty. Um, and you're, you know, you're not given the tools as to how to, how to approach a homeless child during your training, for example, or what things you should look, about, look to or look about. But there's a there, you know there's a hugely growing interest. A lot of our trainees are really focusing on this area, and and I think that they will drive it. They're the they're the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but but you, there needs to be more of it in medical school. That's for sure. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you for for your response to that. We have another question um, related to the to the traveller community. There's a a lot of trauma associated with hidden homelessness. Um, and hidden homelessness is, is an experience, particularly within the traveller community. And the, the participant wishes to ask, um, do you think that we'll see uh, Ireland's definition of homelessness expanded um, from the, the, the current kind of typology that, that, that I think you introduced this def definition, Ellen, at the beginning of your presentation? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that terminology at all, the fancy typology. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what that means, but... Um, uh, I think that the definition probably should be expanded. I mean, you know, we only picked up those numbers in Temple Street by asking each individual parent, uh, oh, and is that your permanent address? Address, And they'll often say, well, no, I'm staying at my mother's, I'm on her couch. And so you pick up those lack of permanent addresses that wouldn't be flagged otherwise because they're not in a, a homeless hub or they're not in, uh, you know, in a, a designated um, emergency accommodation. So I think um, how you expand it or how you open up the def definitions to, to count those numbers will be difficult for sure. I think from a health point of view, that hidden homelessness definitely has the same health consequences as other types of homelessness. So from a, you know, an inclusion health homelessness definition, that would, that would count um, because it's around not having control over your own, own environment, not having privacy, not having security of tenure, all of those things that affect people's health are, would be there very much in that type of hidden homelessness. Mm. Thank you. Um, and, and Rory has, has just added into the, to the chat that it's, it's a, the typology is the, the European uh, typology of homelessness, ethos. So including, it, it also includes hidden homelessness um, and, and it's a, yeah, an important point. We have another question. How do we change the structure causing these health outcomes? So I think part of it is around recognizing the costs associated with them. That's why I'd love to see more economists or social scientists looking at the cost over the life cycle or in the community um, of certain policies. Um, and I think if you look, for example, I know you're having a speaker from Housing First in Finland, you know, because they have a unique personal identifier and they have amazing data they collect on people over their lifetimes. They were, you know, how their Housing First model was brought in by a conservative government because it made economic sense. And so I think that's part of the solution is, is having that type of economic evidence. I think another part of it is around moving away from a, a punitive blaming model. So I think something that we don't talk about a lot is about you know, it's a bit like Dickens or, you know, the Victorian workhouses um, where we punish people for being poor. We feel like it's their fault. Um, and I think we probably need to acknowledge that and move on from it. Absolutely, um, for sure. I, I, you know, I, I think that some of the, the strong points that are coming out of listening to both of your presentations are that joined up thinking, you know, that sharing thinking across disciplines um, and across sectors uh, within um, policy making and also service delivery uh, and, and challenging um, the stereotypes that are, are surrounding um, homelessness, uh, surrounding addiction and, and as you say, moving away from um, the blame model. Um, deserving and undeserving poor and, and really thinking about human rights uh, and housing and home as a, as a human right. 
we have any other questions from the for participants? Just a reminder everyone to keep keep tweeting and, um, you know, get that conversation out there. We can't underestimate the importance of, of, you know, sharing some of these perspectives, which might be, you know, very familiar to some of us in the room. But I, I can certainly say we've all learned something this morning. Um, but but some of this thinking really isn't um, out in the public domain. And mm. and we have to challenge the, the, the stereotypes. And that's part of um, a role of a conference like this is, you know, uh, creating space uh, to hear and to learn um, from each other, but also then to have the responsibility as those of us who have the privilege to be in the room um, here today um, to actually spread, uh, you know, our learning and and to um, and in the context of you know a, a growing uh, far right movement that that ideas like this would be shared and spread. So we encourage you to to do that uh, and also to to bring the the, the presentations which will be linked um, in Reboot Republic um, and also um, on MUSI on the Munich University Social Sciences Institute um, website and use them in the various different spaces that we're in. So I think you mentioned Ellen, you'll bring it back to the medical students um, and we'd encourage everyone here to share as much uh, as possible because there's certainly been um, so much learning and so much um, insight from the speakers this morning. I'm sure everyone's getting a little bit, bit hungry. So maybe I'll invite um, Kleena and, and Ellen to say um, maybe a few words just to, to finally close the session um, and then we'll take our break for lunch. So Kleena, would you like to, to say anything just to end? No, I just I, exactly what you said. I think it's so important that we broaden that lens and, and talk to people from from different disciplines. And I agree with that. This is my first time ever attending a housing conference, uh, so I'm thrilled to be to be to be here and to be involved. And and uh, thank you very much for the invite. Thank you both very much for your really illuminating and very you know comprehensive um, presentations. Just be, before we go, we have one final uh, comment in um, well many comments and people saying you know how much they enjoyed the presentations and how much they learned. So thank you very much uh, for that. And one um, comment from uh, Suzanne Webb, who's in the Centre for Development and Emergency Practice in Oxford Brookes University and Care International in the UK, um, and they're organising a, sh a shelter and mental health learning event, um, and they are, would like to extend an invite invite to the two speakers so I'll, I'll link you up with that um, afterwards um, and uh, that links very well with you know, what we we're saying about sharing and spreading um, this analysis and insights so thanks everyone thanks to, to the participants uh, for your attention throughout a, a long but stimulating morning thanks to all of the speakers um, and you know a reminder to, to keep tweeting um, and see everybody in the afternoon. So the conference starts back at um, two, two o'clock and there is a link in the conference program for the afternoon session. So Ellen and Tina, thank you both really very much. Thanks, Marianne. Bye. Have a great day.